the cardinal sin of making stuff on the internet is not being wrong, is being slightly wrong, <laughs> right? People were literally calling me Hitler. I have worked on teams, agency side for brands like Riot Games, the team for Valorant, League of Legends right now, Xbox and Call of Duty. I drove across the country. I kind of went insane. I was like, we, I had about $200 in the bank account at the time. And I made it to LA and I live essentially in my car for a month. If you see someone yell at somebody, oh my God. I I hate that guy, he right? sucks. Maybe there is some gain in like, I do respect people who yell at people maybe somewhat. <laughs> Uh, Cause it's like, damn. I've always had this philosophy. I've been writing professionally for 10 years now. You need to write like you talk and talk better than you write. Then I got my uh, first job in games journalism. I remember being so proud that I could go to Subway anytime I wanted. For now, this is like weirdly working. Using my brain to like make things for the internet is how I think, I, I think of, that's how I think of like my career is I make things on the internet. Spencer Campbell is many things. He's a creative director at a big ad agency. He's a truly passionate video gamist. He's a tech TikTok superstar with over 70 million views. He also co-hosts a podcast called The Diesel System, dedicated to solving which movie is the best Vin Diesel movie. Uh, this is a longer episode, mostly because the time flew by while we were recording. We talk about how big agencies approach the creative process, how to build viral TikToks, and the hidden risks of parasocial relationships. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I do. You forgot former McDonald's employee also. Of course, yeah. yeah. Cue the shirt. Oh yeah, actually I forgot my shirt to see him properly, yeah. You're like a McDonald's guy. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Oh, that's funny. So when you're working with like, you work with big brands like a Microsoft, you put together campaigns for them? Is that I, you? I like to think of it as I'm part of the team. Okay. We're a team, you know, it's a huge effort and there's a lot of people on my team. There's actually like, I think my team has like 10 people on it, 12 people. And I'm the kind of like a creative lead on that team. Okay. But there's a lot of people above me and a lot of people uh, around me who like work really hard too. So that's kind of like, I, I don't like to think of it as like I lead team, uh, I lead or I like You're make the campaigns. Boss. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I don't think I like make, really, I think. To say like, oh, I make these things. Mm -hmm. I try not to say that too much. Like, I, don't, I don't think it's like the credit is spread very thin across everyone on my team, I think. Totally. Yeah. Or at least I, that's the way I like to think of it. Uh, sometimes I have a stronger hand in things, but a lot of times there's times of where I've gone, things have gone live and I've been like, oh, I completely forgot. Like, cause I worked on the concepting phase of that. And then the production happened kind of like over here and then it goes live and I'm like, wow, that looks amazing. You know, right. I've been, I, and when I like concept something and then someone else goes and works on it in production and then posts it live, I honestly think that I didn't really have much to do with it at mm, all. Like I, I came up with an idea, but like there's a million and one idea of people out there. Right. But personally, I'd like to think of it as just like it's a joint effort. Every post that goes live, it's like that's gone through weirdly. Yeah, this is something maybe people don't know about branded social media is when you work on branded social media. It's been seen by potentially, if it's for like a campaign level beat, let's say that Coca-Cola is coming out with a new flavor that, for example, I've never worked on Coca-Cola, but I would guess that over a hundred people see the post that announces right. that Coca-Cola is coming out with peach flavor. You right. know, I would guess it'd be over a hundred people, well wow. over potentially, wow. to, who see just one tweet. So high level working at a, is creative agency, advertising agency, what's the term? I think that it's creative agency, yeah. Okay. Because, uh, but or maybe it's, I think advertising agency is just the catch-all. Okay. So working at a creative agency, there are a lot of different ways that can go. For anybody who doesn't know what that means or what that looks like, uh, what's the general structure? So there are, uh, at the very high level, to the very low level, like what's, what, what are the stages of people? What's the hierarchy in there? Oh, How does okay, the company yeah. work? So this is really funny because this comes up all the time when I'm interviewing people who have like worked at maybe smaller on teams or did some, ran a social media channel for X, Y, and Z. Right. Uh, when you work at the scale that I work at, which I have worked on teams, uh, agency side for brands like Riot Games, I work, I work on... Uh, the team for Valorant and uh, League of Legends right now, but I've worked on the team for Xbox and Call of Duty and Destiny. When you're working at that scale, the kind of like AAA, kind of international scale, 
it uh, it's actually every task you have to do kind of can be its own job. Mm -hmm. So I work on the creative side, but before creative touches anything, there's actually a strategist mm -hmm. who kind of goes out and surveys the lay of the land, looks at competitor brands, sees what they are doing, and kind of collects a lot of uh, information and delivers it to the creative team mm. in in some cases this all teams are different but so now the creative team gets this brief that has all this information hey usually it has some kind of goal there's a new item coming in apex legends let's say mm -hmm. and or a new new character in apex legends and we want to do a cool campaign well, we've collected a lot of things that other brands have done. Here's how we want to differentiate ourselves. Here's some things that we can maybe learn. And the creative team takes that and kind of uses that as an almost mood board or its base of inspiration. Mm -hmm. And they come up with ideas. They pitch it to the client. You go in. If you've ever seen Mad Men, it's not a very realistic representation of like what you do when you're in that room. But that being in that room does exist where you're sitting there and you're going, okay, we got a lot of great ideas for you. You run through all the ideas. They have their opinions and kind of weigh in. Oh, we were thinking more about we wanted to incorporate fan art more. So then you go back to the drawing board. You kind of like have some ideas that involve fan art. Then you go back to them. And then it actually enters production, which can sometimes even be a separate team than the uh, creative team. Sometimes you actually bring on, a, if it's a big enough idea, sometimes you bring on another agency even, mm. like maybe a, an agency that specializes in video production. And then you have like, an event or whatever it might be where cosplayers come. And then uh, that production happens and then the editing and then that is reviewed with client. And then uh, post, then the next person in that line, actually, when you think about it, the person that you always leave out is somebody needs to post it. Mm. And posting on the internet is really, really hard mm. because the stakes are really high mm -hmm. and each platform has different specifications that you need to, there's like different shapes of videos and different uh, like, uh, different like rules for the captions. And some of them are hard set rules. Like, uh, like Twitter, if you see a brand post hashtags, that's bad, right? Is that's it? like, oh yeah. Why? It's it's lame to use because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it's just like on Twitter. That's not how you surface discoverability, right? Oh, okay. You want your on Twitter. It's like really unique because you want your stuff to surface organically mm -hmm. by people retweeting. You maybe your followers and then their followers see it, and then it has this organic. I think viral spread is the traditional way of thinking about it, and that's how. So if you're doing hashtags and all these like sort of engagement hacky sort of things, that's uncool. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But then on TikTok, yeah. having a really sound hashtag strategy, I think that it's still kind of shaking out what the right hashtag strategy is on TikTok. But as it stands, using a lot of hashtags is fine hmm. in your caption. Most people don't even check, you know? Right. I think probably 99.9% .9 of people don't even look at the hashtags that are on it. Right. Whereas if you see it on Twitter, you immediately flip the switch and you go, I hate this. Instagram, oh. it's a similar way. Because on Twitter, it's like above the fold, so to speak, where on TikTok, you have to like click into view more, see yes. what the description is, hashtags are under there. So they're kind of buried. And I think that people, the viewers kind of come to the platform and they know that's how you play the game here. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's something that I always am thinking about is uh, Marshall McLuhan. Are you familiar with him? No. He's kind of a media theorist, okay. I think might be a, the right term for him, but he has this... Uh, philosophy that the medium is the message have you ever heard that before that's no. probably the most famous thing but no. he uh so like if your work let's say taking it to something that isn't social media like if you're watching a tv show of say, let's say they make a godzilla tv show mm -hmm. well you know inherently that's going to be different than a godzilla movie mm -hmm. why it's because the medium transforms and essentially it, it is the message mm -hmm. the way that something is delivered to you the same way that let's say that i called you and i said i'm headed to the hospital mm -hmm. you think that's like a really urgent thing right right and if i texted you i'm headed to the hospital right. that's just like well is your 
are you why it almost you wouldn't even think of who would text that right right like it must not be serious or it's a joke or yeah right. or like maybe i mean but it can also change the entire context right who would mess who would send that text versus call maybe you're a nurse and you work at the hospital and it's oh, so routine for you right that is an instance that where the medium dictates the message right and the context like the context would be so different a nurse wouldn't call you and say i'm going to the hospital right now right. if they work at the hospital right you know so it's just like the context changes everything and i think that on social media that's like true about everything mm. that you do is that the medium that you're creating and uh, it's just like well i mean it's right in the name right social media mm -hmm. media being the plural of medium mm -hmm. and so uh it's just a lot of different media mediums i guess what media is the plural of medium yeah i didn't know that that's that's funny okay yeah that's why, like mixed media art uh-huh is like mixed mediums oh yeah huh learn something new <laughs> yeah like i should have known that that's interesting yeah okay so uh, there i'm super interested to talk about how all the different platforms are different so how is let's take ones that are more similar so if we were to look at uh instagram and TikTok, because i think those are probably the most like instagram is probably the closest to TikTok, right i i think it's arguable yeah okay how how are they similar how are they different how is the message different between those two well audience is different on mm. instagram and TikTok. Okay. just segmentation wise there's more i bet you these numbers of shit are these numbers are always shifting but Last I heard, there's more Gen Z users on TikTok than millennials. Millennials, I think, are the fastest grow growing audience on TikTok, but I think that Gen Z still wait, outweighs them, and it's the opposite on uh, Instagram, where it's mostly millennials and and a good amount of Gen Z still, and uh, so that kind of dictates the type of content those audiences expect. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. In fact, I'm thinking of the reels versus TikToks versus YouTube shorts that I post for this podcast and where they do well. And usually it makes sense that the audience for the content on this podcast is gonna be more millennial because I'm a millennial and I talk to usually millennials about millennial stuff, right? Like yeah. I'm not inherently interested in the many of the things that Gen Z is interested in. Like, so it makes sense that it works better because for me, often the content performs better on Instagram than it does on TikTok. Yeah, that, that tracks. That makes a lot of sense. Are they, how are they changing? So you're saying that like uh, millennials are starting to go to TikTok more and Gen Zs are starting to pick up on Instagram more, but it's still pretty. I think that both companies in charge of those apps, they're both just heavily marketing to the different audiences that they don't have they want the whole pie yeah, yeah. essentially it's, it, they're still approaching it like it's a winner take all uh scenario i don't know necessarily if that's true but that's kind of where they're that's what i think is happening is it's just marketing i think everything is marketing of course personally of well, course you would think that i would yeah <laughs> so i think it's just the movement of audiences and those kinds of things i see it as kind of uh a very high level this sometimes happens on accident i think this happened with tiktok when it came to america it was just something that uh, a lot of the people who watch Vine, who were generally right. a lot of them younger, yeah. saw this new thing and said, oh my gosh. I mean, even when it was musically before that, musically had it. Are you familiar with that? No. So TikTok, I don't know the specifics of it. I don't know if, uh, but essentially musically was an app that was TikTok. Mm. And it was either purchased or acquired or it had always been TikTok. But essentially that whole uh, you know, it feels like TikTok came out of nowhere and it had a bazillion subscribers, right? Or a billion users. Right. It's because they somehow acquired this audience of Musical.ly oh. and that whole app just became TikTok. Oh. And it was oh, it was already TikTok, uh, which is a Chinese-owned company. Of By course, Dance, they own right? By yeah. Dance owns <laughs> it. But the, uh, that entire audience got bought. And so really, Musical.ly was already popular with incredibly young audiences. Remember when TikTok was all lip syncing and all that? Mm -hmm. That's what Musical.ly was. Oh. And that's why there's such a strong dance 
and, right. and those are those are the strongest footholds because they actually started before TikTok. Wow! So it was a totally different app. With yeah. A, a, or it felt like a different app. It was a different value proposition, and then they like it morphed into TikTok. They took that audience and just like shoehorned them into what became TikTok. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Huh. What about, so if you're going to put together a campaign, so you mostly oh, yeah. work in uh, video games, right? Yeah. So at least for your work at the agency, you mostly do video game stuff. Am I characterizing that correctly? Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do 100% video game okay, stuff. Okay. That's my entire life. Yeah, I've worked okay. in the games industry for like 10 years now in different weird, bizarre external capacities. Yeah. So uh, how... Do you think about the different platforms and the different audiences when you're putting together or working with your team to put together something, you know, a, a launch of a game or a new something, I don't know, new pack coming out? Um, it all comes from really good insight uh, into what's popular on social media. It's I, Everyone on my team is kind of really in a different lane of mm. social media, which is kind of what you it's what you need, because. I feel like your traditional advertising team, which is a bunch of white dudes, you know, <laughs> right. uh, that is that model now is very self-defeating mm. because algorithmically generated content or algorithmically served content, it is uh, everyone on that team is going to be seeing the same things and the universe is going to look very different to them mm. than the reality, which is a very diverse, mixed group of you know, content and creators and all this, they'll, uh, and uh, a team that is all similar is going to look at that content and say the whole world loves, you know, ten, uh, pickleball right now, right? you know, and yeah. then suddenly pickleball is just like invading all these, like you see it in advertising where it's like, this was clearly created by a team of homogenized points of view, right? you know, whereas I think that a really strong, especially social media team, that has to move really quickly, has to be able to, as a team, take a survey of the land. I'm seeing this trend a lot. Are you seeing this trend a lot mm. on your side of the internet? Mm. Oh, like, and it's interesting what things don't make it to the side of the internet that you occupy that might right. be on very big on like, I mean, gaming Twitter versus like advertising Twitter. Those audiences don't know anything about each other, you know? Their content never overlaps. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So you got to get, so that you're not getting false signals so you get, if, if everybody's getting the same signal then you know okay we're actually onto something here yeah 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 so i think that that correlation process we we uh, my current workflow with like at work is that we have like a really strong culture of brainstorming where we will sit in a room for an hour sometimes two hours with the entire team and all of their insight from not just their roles we have uh, wonderful engagement strategists who can overlook like say i've been reading the comments on twitter and instagram and there was this one post that people really resonated with this specific aspect of this post mm. let's say the way that we featured this one character mm -hmm. and then they want to and we so our engagement strategist brings that up and then maybe a uh creative can say i actually saw a meme that uses that character in an interesting way is there some way we can extract what this meme let's say that it's a meme about i want to use a game that i haven't worked on um like in cyberpunk let's say that we do a post where uh there's the character are you familiar with cyberpunk mm -hmm. it's a video game where uh you can you like augment your body with robotics and stuff but mm -hmm. and it's awesome <laughs> but the uh let's say that there's these like blades that can come out of your arms that's really cool players love this and there's so we can focus in on that. Oh, I saw a meme about those arms that kind of like played into how hard they are to use. So the audience, now we know what they like, these mm -hmm. arms. We know something that is a uh, point of truth for all the players who use those arms, which is that they're hard to use. So now we have two points. We can bring them together, and now we can apply a format to that, which is kind of like maybe it's a... Uh, you know, you, you've seen trends online where it's just, uh, gosh, I'm like actively brainstorming right now. It's really hard. Um, <laughs> but it uh, just you can see how that creative process in a room full of, say, six or seven people, 
just pe- bouncing off of each other, really respecting each other too, I think is really important. How do you do that? Uh, as a quick little aside, that like collaborative process and like soliciting feedback, taking feedback the right way. So I have had to learn, I'm much better at it now. Well, I, maybe I shouldn't toot my own horn too much. I'm getting better at it <laughs> where I used to be defensive when I would get, I would do some piece of creative work and then I would give it to somebody and then they would be very, they would have some pretty good feedback, like useful feedback, but I would feel like it was an attack on me and I would shut down and not listen to it and get defensive. And I've had to learn now that if I start to feel defensive that I have to like say the words of being gracious and hide that I'm being defensive (laughs) and then uh, like sit on it. And if I can let it stew in my brain for a day, then almost always the person was right in their feedback and their suggestion. How do you make sure that you guys are able to be collaborative and it's safe for that and people's egos don't get in the way? Like, yeah, it, it that is the constant challenge of being a creative person in a group, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or like being creative together is that you're always just like, oh, I wish you can't see what I can see and stuff. But the thing that helps me, the only thing I really think is I can, this is something that I really struggled with. So I approach it, we're all marching towards the same goal. Mm. There is literally, they are not talking to get one over on me or impress someone they do not care about that. That's like my ego talking, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And so I just really am like, okay, listen, take it into heart. Uh, if I want to combat them, I can't be defensive about it. Mm. I need to ha- come with a point of view that's incredibly strong. Mm. I need to convince them, right? you know? I, and if that isn't worth doing to you or if... Uh, if you just think they're wrong for whatever reason, but you can't quite back it up, maybe it doesn't matter that much to you. Mm. You know, you're just sitting there. Are you just trying to argue with them? You know, it's because right. I get into that mode sometimes. I'm just like, no, I want to do my thing because like, <laughs> I, it's my thing. Like, uh, and so I think it start. That's the first way is personally to do it. Mm-hmm. But also, what we do is there is this brainstorm time where every there's the saying of just there's no bad ideas in a brainstorm, which I think is mostly true (laughs) Um, (laughs) right but then also uh we get i mean this huge wealth of ideas and then what we do is we have a meeting with just the creative team Mm -hmm. and this is usually it's uh myself as a creative director and a copywriter and a designer Mm -hmm. and we sit there and we look at the ideas which at this point are just bullet points that are like uh that might say like make a advent calendar for all the different you know abilities in the game mm-hmm. and so then it's like okay hammer out the specifics of the idea mm-hmm. which is a much smaller group who are focused and on that task so it's like almost like it's collection and then refinement in this next meeting mm-hmm. where we're sitting there and we're looking at okay how can we turn that advent calendar into something that First of all, what shape does it take? Mm -hmm. Is it a video? Is it a still image? Is it a series of still images? Is it something we do every day and it's an advent calendar that people interact with every day? So we do 24 posts in December. And so like we start to break down the actual concept Mm -hmm. and uh, then and a little bit of the execution as well. So it's all about at the begin at the beginning having a wide breadth of opinions mm-hmm. and then it's narrowing down those opinions and once you get into that refinement stage it's actually much easier because you're not starting from zero mm-hmm. and you can look at an idea and say i don't know about this one guys mm-hmm. and so if you do feel like an idea is stupid this doesn't happen very often in my group but i have had it where it's like we just kind of wrote that one down, you know. Right. Maybe it could spark something. I've had those ideas, oh. you know, where it's like, that's ah, a stupid idea. And they wake up the next day going, oh, my God, no, I like it now. Right, right. <laughs> oh, I hate myself. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I spoke uh, yesterday with uh, a, one of my neighbors. He works at Amazon. He's uh, uh, he's an engineer, like a, a full stack engineer, does front end and back end development. And I was asking him about 
the same thought about like being defensive of your ideas. And he said, so I don't know if you've ever heard this. Amazon has a rule where uh, if you are going to have a meeting then or a presentation or something, you have to do a memo. It's like a six page memo that you have to do before a meeting. Whoa. So if you're going to get 10 people in a conference room, you're not going to waste their time. You have to put together like a six page like report memo on what you're talking about. And then at the beginning of the meeting, everybody sits in silence and reads it. So there's like 20 minutes of silent time where you read the memo. And uh, so they do this all across the organization. And he said the a big benefit of that is when people critique the work or have feedback or suggestions, it feels more like they're critiquing the memo than you. So you don't take it as personally. Ooh, yeah. abstraction. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So maybe that's part of the refinement. Like once the idea is on the board or on paper, then when somebody critiques the idea, it feels more like they're critiquing the idea than critiquing you. Because if you like say it out loud and then they are combative with you about it, or maybe they're not combative, but you feel like they're combative. It yeah. Like, it's, it's a trick to remove the ego, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The ability to be like, oh, in paragraph five, there's this little bit about this, like, is that the right way to do it? Like, or is that how we would do? Oh, wow. That's really fascinating. And if only it didn't involve writing a six page <laughs> memo. <laughs> totally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So on the topic of like being collaborative and working with people, how hard is it? Like different clients must have varying levels of like good insight, bad insight. Some are difficult. Some aren't like, how do you deal with that? You know, I've been blessed with amazing clients, is what I'm <laughs> nice, going to say, into nice. a microphone. Uh -huh. totally. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I think that creatively you're just always going to butt heads with clients and things like that. Because really, your goal is to achieve their vision, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. always. They're, it's, you know, so, someone told me early on in my career, it's art for commerce. Mm. Hmm. You want to be an artist? This is not the job for you. You Interesting. Know? I think that I get artistic fulfillment out of my job, and I really do think every once in a while I'm like, this is like art that we're making here. Right, right. But really, it's art for commerce, and I have battled myself with that uh, many times, but I think, you know, I find those wins when I can, and when, but when a client comes to me and says they want something, this is part of my maturing, it does a mature person get mad right. <laughs> you know like right. uh, no no that's a very immature thing to do am i immature Interesting. well my action is going to decide if i'm an immature person or not in this yeah. moment and sometimes i do have my moments but uh i like to think that i'm getting better every day at that yeah art versus commerce i like that framing of it like compromising where the the perception of compromising your creative integrity so like on I imagine that it can happen one working with clients also in creating your own stuff online. Like we have this notion of this is the highest form of my art. This is <laughs> whatever, but maybe that's not what the client wants. Maybe that's not what's going to perform well on TikTok or YouTube or whatever you're putting your content. And so there's a question of, is it selling out to do something that's going to resonate or is that your goal? Like, how do you, how do you balance the idea of creative integrity and commerce and performance? And maybe also it's flawed for me to propose those two things as being at odds. Maybe, maybe it's wrong to think of those at odds at all. I think that is, um, yeah, creative, creative integrity is a trap. Mm, okay. I think that if you get into like thinking about like, oh, I need to, yes, I'm damaging my integrity uh -huh. by committing to this work, whatever it might be, whether it's because it's a Pepsi commercial or because you're being asked to do something that you think is a bad idea or whatever, you are falling into a trap. Mm. You're, if your creative integrity is so fragile that it's damaged by doing what you gotta do right then i'm sorry you're you need to work on that wow. that's you yeah. know uh yeah every once in a while i do have to make compromises like is right. that really so bad right uh it's we're all again we're all going towards the same goal mm -hmm. so why get so hung up on integrity when it's a joint effort this person because what you're really doing is you're accusing the person who wants you to do this thing of having no integrity 
Oh. That's like so fucked up. Right. Your right. creative integrity is so just absolutely corrupt. And mine is so. <laughs> right. Oh, no, I'm an artist. Why, how dare you ask me to do this for Pepsi? Right. I, I'll only do what I want to do for Pepsi. Right. It's nuts. It's nuts. At least in my industry, I think maybe some places, uh, movies, the, being an auteur, uh, I don't think that in my career I get to exercise that very much. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky that I think. I get to have, uh, I get to play pretend auteur on like my TikTok channel every once in a while when I make a video and I'm like, I get to control every single aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I can change the sentences. I can do, I can rearrange things. I can make mistakes on purpose and see how that, but when I'm over here, I, I can't do that. You mm. know, uh, I'm, I'm operating on, on as part of a team mm. and I need to hold myself to the standards of integrity that that team has. Mm -hmm. And I just think that getting caught up in like, I just have creative integrity. It's really pretentious. Yeah, totally. Totally. I love that perspective. I love that. That's not even, it's not even a question for you. It's like, that's a silly goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Uh, how do you get creative? It's uh, maybe this is the auteur like, uh, arrogant artist in me, but there are times where I just don't feel very creative. Like I just, I don't know if it's block or I'm just not motivated, but it's your job. You have to do it. Yeah. How do you approach that? Um, you know, I think having a really rigid system, mm. like the brainstorming and the, uh, then refining and then, and also understanding that you can do, there's like a lot of phases of the creative process. And so you can, if, if you really understand the like stream of creativity, you can kind of slip in at any time, any mm. point in that process on something like, uh, cause everything that you do creatively, it starts out as an observation and that observation turns into an idea mm -hmm. and that idea you refine into a concept and that concept you execute. Mm -hmm. And so if you understand that process, you can just say, today I'm just going to observe. I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the landscape, see what's popping off, what movies are coming out, what movies came out this year, see what how they performed. I'm thinking about what's resonating with people online. That can take the shape of even just going into Instagram and TikTok and looking at comments and seeing what people are saying, what comments. I love comments. I think that comments are the coolest place to get inspiration because those are human beings, you know? Yes, I love. My favorite place for dialogue is Reddit. I feel like it oddly, I'm, dude, I'm not plugged in enough. I might sound like a total idiot when I say this, but to me, Reddit feels like the most democratic, not in political terms, but it just feels like you really get a lot of perspectives and it feels like there are fewer bots and <laughs> definitely plenty of bots still, but I don't know. A lot of the other platforms, either you can tell everybody that's commenting is 13 or it like gets really racist really fast, <laughs> yeah. but Reddit seems to be a pretty good self-regulating system. Where do you find good comments? Oh my gosh. The worse the comment, the better for me. <laughs> okay. um, I'll say that. I love going into like complex, let's say, and they post about, I don't follow sports at all, mm -hmm. but the way that I learn about sports is it'll be like this player traded to this team and I, okay, is this a big deal? I go into the comments. I'm seeing what's happening in culture in real time. People being like, oh, he should have stayed with that team. Oh, I don't know. Like... Oh, if only we could get him on this team. Oh, the Bears are terrible every year. Why would he go there? I'm learning about the entire cultural landscape, mm -hmm. getting getting the full context of this one individual event. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, I think I I love like yeah. There's like more specific pages, complex and all that. Those are like cool. I think that like some specific creators, it's sometimes fun mm. to go into and look at how their community interacts with them. I think that there's a lot of things like uh, that are talked about often on stuff like this, like parasocial relationships. Mm -hmm. And you can see how those sh take shape in the comments mm -hmm. because those are the people who are commenting. Right. Yeah. The uh, uh, On parasocial relationships, have you ever felt that with, has there ever been a creator where you really like them? You're like, shit. Oh, oh, I, oh no, I'm in one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll okay. So I, I, I was, I found myself, uh, 
with Casey Neistat, the the YouTube oh my guy. Gosh, yeah. That that's probably the only one where I've ever been like fully committed. Like all of a sudden I'm like, oh shit, is this how it happens to people? Like I'm watching every single video. I'm like Googling stuff about him. It's kind of yeah. I feel weird. Yeah, yeah. He comes up in conversation, and you're like, oh my God. He like used to have this company yeah. and then he like he like left and like he had a good job and like and you're like proselytizing about them. Right. Like they're your son. Like it's <laughs> right. like like their accomplishments reflect on you, you know? Mm -hmm. Like uh I knew him from the beginning. Yeah, I, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, it's just like you want to be like you're you're a Swifty, you right, know? What totally. I mean? Yeah, uh, Casey Neistat is a great example where uh -huh. it's just like I feel like me and him could just jam, you know? Like me and him. If <laughs> totally. we, meanwhile, if I talk to Casey Neistat, let's be real, I would have nothing to say to him that he right, hasn't heard totally. before. Yeah, or thought a hundred times, or thinks is stupid. Right. So it's just like, uh, th like I think that I fall into that trap. The one that I really fell into it with was, um, and this is almost embarrassing. I mean, it was Corridor Digital. What's that? Uh, they do the VFX artist reacts video. Oh, okay. Are you, are you from? And like, it's they like YouTuber ass YouTubers where they're doing react videos, but they they have like a cool flair to them, and mm -hmm. they have individual like they're like the Beatles. You can love one and another, and then hate the next, and then like the next one, and they're just a gaggle of people, and they seem to really love each other and it's like boy if i could infiltrate that group i wonder if they need someone to run their social media right. like you know yeah. like i could i bet i could send them my resume or something <laughs> i'm starting to fantasize about committing labor for them right. <laughs> like oh my god and it's just uh it's um yeah that, that, i got it really bad with them because i I was an OG. I followed them since the beginning, I want to <laughs> say. Uh, they made a Minecraft video that was popular like 13 years ago, and then I became uh, obsessed with them. And it was honestly maybe <laughs> messing up my brain a little bit because wow. I was thinking about, like, I wonder what they're doing because they're in L.A. as well. Oh, right. Just yeah. fantasizing about running into them or something. And what? I don't know. Right. This happens to them constantly. Right. You know, and I'm sure they're appreciative, but, I mean, the fantasy is not going to live up to the reality. Yeah, they're going to be like, hey, man, I like your shirt. Do you want to come run our social media? Like, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, do you want to, like, hang out sometime? Uh, yeah. So, okay, on that, there's something that a shift that's happened in the algorithm that is i mean i don't know i guess it's probably dumb to to say if something is good or bad it just is as these things evolve it feels like five years ago before tiktok and reels and shorts people were consuming creators like people were subscribing to creators and developing parasocial relationships and like they they got really invested in creators now the short form content revolution has like in many ways removed that where i think people are now spending much more of their time they still follow certain creators but you can be massive on TikTok and like, your audience isn't going to follow you to another platform and people are you're only as valuable as your last video you know there's no like whereas like the Casey Neistat's and the Ember, Emma Chamberlain's and these people built these audiences that uh, will follow them to the end of earth like if every platform imploded tomorrow and a new one came up like their audience would follow them right away because they're committed to them uh, i think that that parasocial relationship is probably less common now it's certainly harder to activate against i okay. think it's still happening okay but it's just very different and it happens day to day really hmm. even moment to moment the tiktokers who are building parasocial relationships now via specifically only tiktok they're not trying to transition to youtube and make longer form content which i think is the traditional route to try and go, which does work for some. I've seen it work for people. But the uh, the route that TikTokers, especially young TikTokers, who are like maybe in their teens, mm -hmm. they're making maybe multiple videos per day oh. where they're just talking. And they're kind of just communicating with their audience about what their day is like. Hey, just went to go get some boba, whatever. This is a huge category on TikTok that is like unspoken, sort of like you've seen, I'm sure, Get Ready With Me videos. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of 
people this is a very common format where people will do their makeup in the morning and just talk about today i'm gonna do this and mm -hmm. talk through their day and maybe a little bit of their personal philosophy in the mix mm -hmm. and then you find that person that you align with who makes this style of content you are in the slipstream you are just obsessed with them you're wow. buying their merch and this kind of goes in line with you think you want a million followers right well no you want a thousand crazed followers. I can't remember who. A thousand true fans. True I think. fans. Yes. I can't remember the yeah. name. Yes. So anybody listening, go find this article. Um, I heard about it from uh, Tim Ferriss. I think was suggesting it a lot. It's yeah. The article is called "A Thousand True Fans." That's I believe. What it is. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So expand on this, please. It's really, really interesting. So let's say, just from a financial perspective, if you can get a thousand true fans who can give who will buy everything you put out mm -hmm. and love listen to every podcast you do. That is the goal. Mm -hmm. 1,000 true fans. If you can convince 1,000 people to give you $10 a month, you make $120,000 a year. Right. Pew. You're good. Yeah. You know, Th off 1,000 people. Right. I, on my personal TikTok channel, I have about around 300,000. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, getting money from them... <laughs> I never even really tried because it kind of felt unethical, but I did do a couple like Lincoln bio sort of deals, which I personally realized I don't like doing. Yeah. But the uh, I did a few of those and the click through rate is beyond nothing. Mm. It's like so low. You could get a video that gets 100,000 views and you're looking at 0.01% click through rate, like right. 10 people clicking the link. Right. It's really nuts. Uh, and it's just because you need those crazed fans. Right. You need people who will buy something that says that they are aligned with you. Mm -hmm. I think building that relationship, do I find it ethical? I'm not sure. And I don't really want to find out by experimenting on myself. Right. <laughs> like being like, okay, I got these people who are completely obsessed with me because I've seen the other side of that coin where crazed fans, especially for video games on social media, will be like very disrespectful of the mm. brand and i would think that would apply to a person as well when they do something that is maybe out of character right for them let's say that you know uh i have a differing opinion on i mean even something as small as fast food i'm sure can set someone off these crazed fan type right. of people true fan type of people yeah because let's be real who are you a true fan of is there someone that you buy everything you watch every video you are totally aligned with them Probably not, right? Right. It's not really a... I think that there's a high chance of this true fan mentality of it being someone who maybe it's just there's something I don't want to say abnormal about them. Right. But certainly I don't know anyone who consumes content in this true fan style for anyone. Right. It's like a little exploitative to be like you're taking who, money from like crazy 14 year old or yeah, something. Who, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even want to make a guess as to who it might be. Right. It could be a 40 year old who is retired off from the military and is just like, that's how he spends his military pension. Like right. I, there's, there's whole swaths of people that it could be. And I don't exactly feel comfortable taking their money so directly. So this thought about moving people from, so uh, to your earlier point about people having their own little echo chambers and not knowing what the whole algorithm is like, I just made the assumption that people aren't doing that same type of content on TikTok because I don't get served that content on TikTok of like people talking about their day and getting ready and stuff. So that proves your point that like, I just assumed that it wasn't happening because I don't get that served in my algorithm. <clears throat> Every me. type of content exists. Okay, that, it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's... There's some law about that. Like, it, it, yeah, everything exists. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's really nuts what's happening. There's like... I recently found someone who does five minute video essays on TikTok mm. where they stand. It's really, I think, innovative. I'm obsessed with formats mm -hmm. on social because you can do whatever you want. You don't have to create like think about if you're making a TV show, you have to have ad breaks, mm -hmm. which means you have to have a kind of beginning, middle and end to each chunk of your content. So let's say you're making a game show. You need to have three segmented content like uh sections of your show mm -hmm. most of the time and so because that's just the way you need something at the end that drags you to the beginning so you're you're it's the medium dictating the message again okay social media you're a little bit you're more free because you can make a five minute video where you are standing in front of a projection talking about a conspiracy about glitter and like 
there's this huge and have a slideshow and you're just have a camera pointed at you standing in front of doing essentially what is a presentation. Right. And that's compelling content and just as compelling as a 15 second video where you break down like a new mechanic for a game. Those can live on the same platform. Mm -hmm. And that's that's essentially two pieces, two like different mediums to me. Mm. They're both videos, mm -hmm. but they're presented in such different ways that I think that they are different like media forms of media the challenge it must be tricky that the platforms do favor certain things like just like with music you could make a song that's 45 minutes long or a song that's 15 seconds but like you know there is a sweet spot of like whatever like two to four minutes is really how long your song should be and with the way that Spotify works with playlisting now, like your song really needs to have like a really strong catch in the first 10 seconds to, you know, keep people on. Otherwise they're going to pull you from the playlist because your conversions aren't good or whatever it is. So uh, with TikTok, the five minute standing in front of a slideshow video, I mean, maybe they have found their audience, but TikTok surely favors videos that have like less, that have a hook in the first three seconds. And, um, whatever right? like the way that these platforms push content towards what is most profitable for them or youtube where basically every video is between like 10 and 12 minutes long now yeah, <laughs> because yeah. the ad break insertions is there is it harder to make content that's unique on these platforms for that reason no i think it's way easier really oh yeah okay. you can do whatever you want okay and i think making content that's unique that performs to your liking. Mm -hmm. See, I think that we hyper focused on this uh, performance, I think in part because it's public. Uh -huh. TV show, you're watching TV show, there's not a little thing in the corner that says how many people watch that show. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, there's not a thumbs up and a thumbs down that tells you if it's good or bad. Yeah. There's all these bizarre things that are in the paradigm of social media that I don't understand why they're public at all. Like views, are you, what do you gain by knowing the views on a video? Interesting. As a, as a user, nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that that being public, that becomes the fixation. Views is the goal. Mm. But you, I've made many a video that have gone a million plus, 10 million. I've gotten, not to brag, <laughs> uh, I've had a few, few videos that have gotten 10 million plus views. And then I'll see a video that has 3 million views. And it's like, this is a trending huge moment that we need to capitalize on say from a brand perspective mm -hmm. this is like a, tr a a really hot trend and the video has three million views right and so how come my 10 million view video isn't valued as much as this three million view video mm -hmm. is well it's because the that number is overhyped oh so because the cultural impact of a three million view video that has like a really funny hook that you can remix and you can kind of have your own take on, maybe you make your own video using the audio of like this person talking about, talking to their cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can make it about how much you love Mountain Dew. And these, these like, there's a lot of different things that can kind of impact a video's perceived performance mm -hmm. beyond views. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just like, yeah, shares and those kinds of things. There's lots of metrics, but views just becomes this point of fixation because it's just in front of everyone. Oh, you know, okay, so that reminds me of the, um, with podcasting, the, uh, uh, so I put these on YouTube, so, you know, views are public, but I've noticed a lot of podcasts won't do that, and there is the, whatever, the benefit, I guess, of nobody can see how many views an RSS feed has, Yeah. so I guess that's helpful. I think people. that that has helped a lot of podcasts, yes, just the, and I think it's just like, it helps you stay committed, because just not only is everyone seeing it every time they open your video, you're seeing it every time you open your video. The numbers are down. It's just constantly clear. Right. Whereas uh, with a podcast, you upload it, some people listen to it, you check your metrics, maybe the next day, maybe a week later, and you're like, great. Seems like the numbers are good. Mm -hmm. But having like this chart and all these things, and like you can be a real data nerd about it and get into the mix uh you are wasting your time you're mm -hmm. not making anything when you're doing that mm -hmm. <laughs> aren't you just trying to make stuff why are you trying to get in there i think that there's something about like a b testing and finding out what works and doing things that appeal to your audience and experimenting constantly but 
you need to be really conscious because it's easy to just get lost in the numbers. I totally agree. I think that there's been this Mr. Beastification of content where respect to Mr. Beast. I am like, I, I, I bow down, man. I kiss the ring. He's, <laughs> he's killing it. But he has made it a goal for basically every young person who wants to be a creator to say, okay, like try a hundred thumbnails and hyper focus on the algorithm and everything just becomes, I don't know how to describe it, but it all feels the same and uh, a little cheesy and there's not as much, oh God, this is going to sound so arrogant, but there, there's less unique content, I think, or like there's, maybe it's just not as popular, but well, it's so what Mr. Beast is doing is he found a format that works really well. Mm -hmm. And he said it many times. He thinks he could get a video to 10 million subscribers without from zero in six months and stuff like that. Like, and I, I kind of believe him. Uh, but I think that he, he is really, really good at making the type of content that the algorithm wants. Mm -hmm. I think that, that everyone would agree with that. He has all those tips. I like, he, he has like such concrete tips for the type of success that YouTube wants you to have. Keep your uh, retention to 70%. That's amazing. Like, yeah, like do everything. Think about that 70% mark of your video and then keep retention. Yes, that's the goal so that you can talk to the algorithm and make it happen. But the thing that you realize, you don't all need to have Mr. Beast's level of success. Mm. If you can get 10% of his success, you can make a good living. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you find the little cracks that he's not filling, mm -hmm. which he does these kind of really bombastic, huge videos that have big payoffs at the end that build. That's a very specific type of person who watches that content, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean that you, sh if you're starting a channel about journaling, let's say, that doesn't mean you should follow Mr. Beast's playbook unless that's the type of success you want to have, the type of audience you want to have. Again, if you go into the comments on anyone's channel and go and look at who is talking to this person, is that your audience? Is that who you can talk to organically? Mm. And a lot of people have found a lot of success kind of emulating the Mr. Beast style and finding ways to express themselves in that format. But it is a format. There's game show formats. Uh, quiz shows and it's, I see it as just like the a Mr. Beast video people see it as the end all be all it's the perfect YouTube video every vi every YouTube video should be like a Mr. Beast video mm -hmm. and I think if you want to have that type of success obviously emulate what he's doing mm -hmm. but if you want to find your own success if you want to like build a channel of 500,000 subscribers right which you're not going to be breaking the millions and honestly it's probably gonna be hard for you to go full time if you're living in a big city you know but you'll be able to build something sustainable. Whereas I think that Mr. Beast's audience is incredibly transient. Mm. You can lose everyone when somebody else makes a, I, can't, I went from a penny and then I bought a spaceship. Right. Well, guess what? But I, I'm the guy who bought the house. I went from the penny to the house. Right, right. I'm still cool, right? No, nah, that guy bought, got a spaceship. I think that those people just like blip over here mm -hmm. very easily uh, because a lot of them aren't like obviously subscribers are a big deal. But I think that a lot of your audience when you're making content, surprisingly, is not the people who click subscribe mm -hmm. because the people who click subscribe there's this misconception that the people who click some subscribe are the same people who watch videos mm. how many accounts do you subscribe to say in six months how many new youtube channels do you subscribe to i don't know uh 10 or 20 maybe i don't know 10 or 20 i would say it's probably on the high side okay but 10 or 20 so you're competing if i want you yeah. Right. To subscribe to me. Yeah. I am competing with how many YouTube videos do you watch in a six month period out of all those you only they all say it. They all say, can you hit subscribe and maybe you hit 10 or 20. Mm -hmm. And then even after that, because everything is still algorithmically served to you, I think, you know, sub subscriber gives it a little boost in the algo. So you're more likely to see their videos. But now they still have to convince you to click their video. Right. And so they're competing in the exact same ecosystem. They have a slight edge, but how many YouTube channels are you subscribed to if you've been subscribing to 20 
every six months for the last 10 years, you're subscribed to hundreds of channels. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, a lot of these also are like, I'm just identifying as like, oh, a smart person would subscribe to the 60 Minutes YouTube channel. So I'll, oh, I'll subscribe, yes, yes. but I'm not going to watch most of their videos. Like it's, <laughs> it makes almost no difference as to whether or not I watch their video. Yeah. And so that's, it's kind of like, subscriber count really is just like seen as this gold standard that isn't true you can go find it on youtube there are people with four million subscribers who get uh eight thousand views a video and there are people with two hundred thousand subscribers who get fifty thousand a hundred thousand views per video mm -hmm. and even more going beyond how many subscribers they have you know into the five hundred thousand range like i've seen it all because a fun thing to do on YouTube is to just go and click on profiles. Just go in mm. and just start clicking, and you'll be shocked at how many uh, subscribers people you've never heard of have, and like how the different types of YouTubers who can find an audience of 100k. Because mm. 100k seems like you have to be doing Mr. B style content. You have to be hitting the algo. You have to be so smart. You have to be. And actually, you can go find a lot of people who just post like them playing Mario 64 mm -hmm. five minutes at a time every day and they were able to hit 200 300,000 subscribers doing that mm -hmm. and it's just i think that the there's the mr beastification of everything not only is it like uh maybe you know i think you could say whether or not it's ruining things but it's certainly uh impacting the impression of how you get successful mm -hmm. on cuz i think that there's all those avenue, avenues have always been open. Your journaling thing where you make two hour videos of you just writing in your journal about your day. And uh, I think that that could be a very successful channel if you committed to it every day. And mm -hmm. like maybe you do uh, supplementary videos about how to journal and maybe you do shorts where, you know, there's just like lots of different avenues for content mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily in that Mr. Beastosphere mm -hmm. that you won't break 10 million subscribers, but I think you'd be shocked at how many you can get. And I, I think that people don't realize how miserable you could be if you succeed. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> uh, in, so my background is largely in business and there are many people who want to start a business because they, it's a romantic idea. So like 10, 15 years ago, everybody was trying to open a Subway franchise. This is when the $5 foot long was a thing. And so all these people were like, okay, I'm gonna pour my life savings into opening up a Subway franchise and then I'll be my own boss. And what they realized is they made the same amount of money or less as they did in their previous job. And they work more hours per week in a sandwich shop and they're miserable. And it's like, they just like, careful what you wish for. I wonder if I would imagine a lot of people who don't care at all about the content that they're making. Like oh, yeah. they're just making, you know, penny to rocket ship videos because <laughs> they want to have the algorithm succeed. If they get to a certain point, it's like, okay, now I've hit a million subscribers. And, you know, I actually, a long time ago, I uh, was doing a photo shoot for some JC Penny influencer campaign. I was the photographer for this thing. And one of the influencers there had an audience that she enjoyed and she made content that was true to her. And she seemed like pretty at peace and happy and like was like fulfilled by her work. And there was another influencer there who uh, clearly like was irritated by her audience. Like her audience was uh, too young for her and she had to make content that didn't fit uh. her style. And she like changed into these clothes that were not the clothes that she wore to the shoot because it was like what her audience expected to see her in. And <laughs> this is very anecdotal, but like she seemed deeply unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if people are like opening a Subway franchise with their YouTube channels, like they're building stuff they hate to do. <laughs> I think that there is some truth in that. Yeah. Well, what's success on social media and YouTube, which I include in social media, mm -hmm. but uh, what's success? Growth. What are growth audiences? Young people always mm -hmm. because they're coming into the platform mm -hmm. and so they're more likely to hit subscribe they're more likely to uh fall in love with you and build a years long go on this years long journey with you mm -hmm. where i mean everyone you love everyone whose content you love has there been anyone new who's entered yes i mean for me 
I'm a bit of an edge case because I'm really diving deep on podcasting right now. So I keep uh, finding new podcasters. But to your point, I agree, especially as people get on the back half of their 20s into their 30s, like we're just less curious people. Humans get less curious as they get older. You kind of know what you like. I, I listen to less new music these days. I, oh, yeah. So, yeah, you get more comfortable. You kind of like find your groove. Uh, yeah, we're just less curious as we get older, I guess. Yeah, more just, I mean, more content with what we found in our lives over the course of our lives uh, which is just so natural you know what you're about at a certain point yeah and so like convincing someone young to hit the plus sign on tiktok it's much easier than convincing someone who's older yeah and that's like a huge part of the of the growth mentality is if you want to grow infinitely quickly Mm -hmm. the fastest way is to appeal to young people because Mm -hmm. they're the ones trying to define themselves and find out who they are maybe it's this and if you can retain say 20 percent of that audience that's pretty good you know uh versus trying to convince someone who watches every casey neistat video that your casey neistat style (laughs) video is worth watching when you kind of know what you're craving you know totally so that's something that i found also is that my audience was incredibly young Mm. Uh, yeah, because I'm just like really positive and just trying like I, I I took a lot of inspiration from people like Hank Green, who I, I like his content style and also like Mr. Rogers. I take a lot of uh, like Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, PBS? yeah. All right. Nice. He's very clear, concise, mm-hmm. simplifies everything. Sometimes he'll even Mr. Rogers will even simplify things down to to the point where it's too simple. Right. Mm. Where it's oversimplification. But that's so that it pulls you in the door. Mm-hmm. You know, he'll tell you about how uh, I'm just talking about Mr. Rogers right now. Dude, I love Mr. Rogers. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, he might do uh, tell you how, let's say, a uh, garden hose is made mm. and just takes you through the process. And it's clearly got to be an oversimplification because it's a manufacturing process. But uh, he just he, it's just like a little video thing that he plays. And he says, wow, that was fascinating. And then moves on because he's not trying his goal is not to teach you how garden hose is made. He's trying to just kind of inspire you into seeing the world in a different way. Mm. So now when you see a garden hose, you know that that was made. Mm. You know, he's talking to a very young audience. And that's kind of what I like to do with my like silly videos that I make on TikTok. I make tech related content. And originally the big thing that I wanted to do was arm people so that when they go into Best Buy and buy a TV, they are not a victim of mm. the ecosystem of buying a TV where you're going in, getting upsold on, oh, it can do this and that. Oh, like Dolby Vision. Oh, that sounds cool. What <laughs> is Dolby Vision? Right. You know, explaining those simple things very concisely, sometimes in a way that it's like literally all you need is so that when you go into Best Buy, you feel empowered with your decision mm. because God, you you could just walk in there and just I I don't know I came in to buy a TV. What size do I need? Uh, you know, like you, right. it's just it's so hard uh, to go into the tech space, and so there isn't really anyone doing that, at least that I noticed. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, maybe I could try doing this, and I, I found some success along with like all the goofy experiments I was doing. What was your experience doing that? Like, if you okay, so I noticed you. Uh have not been posting as frequently lately is it that you i don't know what, what what's your perspective on it now that you've had some success like you took a shot at that and it worked now you i don't know what's your perspective now i've kind of dropped the mic on it right mm-hmm. a little bit i think i'm still thinking of it as a break um i'm just taking a break i think i haven't posted in like eight months maybe more yeah but i've first of all i've been i got a new job i'm focusing on that and mm-hmm. just like really pouring myself into my career right now uh i do find myself like thinking of how i would make a comeback and things like that but it's just like when i think about it i really want to add something meaningful hmm. uh because i um i think of the internet as it's the greatest collective work of art mankind has ever created hmm. it's just we are all every single thing you put on the internet you're adding to this incredible tapestry Mm. and so it's my like life's work contributing to that tapestry Mm. you know if i have to do it on behalf of a brand or whatever i just want to make a nice just quilted square and add it to this beautiful gigantic bigger than the pyramids work of art that we've been making for the last 
20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like it's so, so cool that it's so easy to do that. And I think it's really, what's really nuts about that is people view it as so insignificant hmm. be making things on the internet. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Because success is so clearly defined when you make something on the internet. If I sit down and I make a little statue, a little clay statue, I'm learning to make clay. Mm -hmm. Well, for some reason, if you make a video about making that statue, then that's your job, is making the videos about making the statue. Mm -hmm. Making the statues is not what you do. Mm. Uh, and that's how you make your money, is not selling these statues or whatever. And for some reason, you got to go to the next level on that as well, where you got to sell these statues, you got to sell content, you got to get advertisers. But it's all because you made a video about your hobby. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other side of the coin is, you probably have friends who do stuff like that, do woodworking and stuff. And they just do it as a hobby. It's just fun for them. Mm -hmm. And the idea of like telling them you should make an Etsy shop, that's like annoying. Right. You know, for some reason, once you point a camera at your hobby, your only goal is to monetize it. Right. But I view making things on the internet as my hobby. Nice. Yeah. And so sometimes I step away, I come back, mm -hmm. and the work of art has only gotten better because everyone has been contributing to it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's fun <laughs> to return and build things continue to build things i've been making things on the internet for i think now over 20 years mm -hmm. i can i was a contributor on Newgrounds, and which are you familiar with this mm -hmm. it was a flash-based website where uh you could go and community submissions were encouraged the entire thing was community run anyone could climb to the top and be, make it to the front page for a day which that was always my goal. Like, I wonder if I can make something that can make it to the front page. I never did because <laughs> I wasn't very good because I was a teenager. But there were a lot of teenagers who found success on that platform and now have gone on to find a lot of success on YouTube and stuff like that. Ego Raptor, Aaron Hansen is an example of someone who started out on Newgrounds and just consistently made cartoons on the internet and then became a personality and then built an empire. Hmm. And it all started on this little website like 20 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, and it's just... Uh, I think that that journey is the real journey of an influencer. A lot of people have these are seeing these influencers that were maybe entered into the ecosystem as as recent as like three or four years ago. I think that uh, the Bella Porches and the like uh, Charlie D'Amelios, I people view them as the gold standard, mm -hmm. and I think that obviously they're going to be successful their whole lives. Mm -hmm. But as an aspirational figure, if you look at their success. I'm sorry, it's not happening to mm, you. Right. Because I think that there were just so many things that aligned for them. And every creator who found that like viral, quick, explosive success. And so it's like uh, Bo Burnham has said this, where it's like uh, going to someone and who won the lottery, right? And saying, how did you do it? Oh, my God. Like, what advice do you have? And what would they tell you? Honestly, the best advice they could give you is go buy lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. You know, like they just, there was not really skill involved. Right, right. Or the skill that it was involved is not what led to the success. Oh. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think that, like, I think there's a lot to be said about the Bell Porches and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Charlie D'Amelios of the world who had this skyrocket success and sustained it. How did they, so the names sound familiar, but I'm not familiar. So oh, they're you, TikTokers. Okay, so they're TikTokers. They, they're like, uh, I think number two and number three most followed TikTokers. Okay. Something around, and that's been the top five. Okay. And they do like dance videos, I think is probably their main bread and butter. But now it's just like their life, their personality is kind of, they, it's like, they participate in trends and things like that. But I think they are just their own ecosystem. Charlie D'Amelio now has a show on Hulu. Hmm. She's kind of like, her, fa her and her family, like the new Kardashians, I think, in, a, mm. in a, at least in some way. And it's just, I think that their skill is not this meteoric rise, which many people experience. It's sustaining mm -hmm. that. And I think that that comes with lots of like management help and lots of things behind the scenes, but also a, a certain uh, like perseverance also on their part. Mm. And that is not what you need to learn if you want to be successful. You need to understand that, like, if you... There are people who bank on getting that and get it, and that's amazing for them, that meteoric sudden rise, and, or, like, 
that one video that hits, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but I think that really, if you want to build a, if you want the best chance of building a career on the internet, you need to build slowly mm -hmm. and you need to find something to sustain you in the meantime, honestly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've thought about giving it a shot being like a full-time creator, but it's just like, I can't sustain a life pursuing that as an adult person, you know? Do you think that, like you said, when you point your camera at your hobby, it doesn't become fun anymore. There is a certain aspect to like, once you make your hobby, your job, it starts to suck and you look at it differently and it's not fun. Do you think it would kill the magic for you or it would stop being fun or like do you, do you think it would shift your relationship with content creation if you were relying on it to like pay your bills yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think that there are a lot of content creators who fall into this trap who um like on twitch this was actually a huge uh thing for creators who what they were doing was during the Amber Heard trial, right? A lot of Twitch streamers pivoted to streaming the trial because people wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. And so if you made Mega Man content, there were like Mega Man Twitch streamers who were going over and just being like, this is what's getting views. I'm just going to do it. Right. And I'm going to make my money now because you're, you're making money off ads. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll be able to sustain some of this audience that this growing audience Maybe I'll make a pivot into whatever this category is. <laughs> right. Maybe this is going to be a huge category going forward, streaming court cases, and maybe I will be one of the pioneers of this new category. Mm. That didn't happen, right. but it, I think that it was very possible. Like, it's easy to see how they would get in that headspace. Yeah. yeah. They're finding a ton of su instant success. And then I, I haven't really checked in with the phenomenon after the fact, but I'm guessing a lot of these people either saw massive fall off which is fine. That right. was not their goal, you know, was to like gain and it was just to capitalize on this moment. But if it's your full time job, you talk about creative integrity. Those are the compromises you have to make. Right. You know, you are leaving money on the table if you don't cover the Amber Heard case. It does not matter if you have anything to say. It does. You are sitting in your bed going, if I stream Amber Heard tomorrow, I will make 10x more money than if I stream Mega Man. Right. Uh, it's just hard to reconcile that, I think. Right. And this yeah. is what pushes people, I think, into that Mr. Beastification of like, well, if the algorithm, if I'm going to make more money on AdSense by whatever, you know, a thumbnail where I'm laying under a car screaming, like, <laughs> that's what I got to do. The thumbnail <laughs> thing, I think, is overblown. I think that yeah? thumbnails, YouTube thumbnails, the state of YouTube thumbnails is way overblown uh -huh. because it is a way to communicate with you, mm -hmm. right? If you click a video and, cause I think of the entire thumbnail ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you click a video that has that Mr. Beast style thumbnail with the big white eyes and all that. They are communicating with you. People think, I don't believe all this algorithm nonsense that there's a facial algorithm scanning all the thumbnails and right. serving thumbnails. It's the algorithm, the way it works is if someone clicks a video and watches it, it gets a little more juice. Totally. It is not scanning. The, I don't, I don't think, you know, there's no information either but way. That's not even a signal that YouTube would want to use. Like they, mm -hmm. they, I read uh, the YouTube formula by Daryl Eves, which goes over kind of, you know, what his perception on how this stuff is favored. And he said, pretty much YouTube is straightforward they want content that people want to watch because they want to keep people on the platform like it's not that hard just make a video that where the thumbnail and the title deliver on the content of the video that people want to watch like if you make a good video with an enticing thumbnail that's the secret to success yeah <laughs> like it's not yeah and i think that that but like when you make that mr b style thumbnail you're not just saying the content of the video mm -hmm. you're also relaying the format of the video mm. you know this is going to be one of those videos where the thumbnail is the juice to get you in. It is a contract that you have with the YouTuber because they, when you see a thumbnail like that, you know that they have compromised on something so that they can deliver a message to you. And that message is, this is a Mr. B style video. Right. You know, this is that type of video where I'm going to be reacting. And there's like, it lays out the format for you. Mm -hmm. And when you think of it that way, every thumbnail 
does that is clickbait right. where it's a holiday gift giving guide and they show everything and they blur one out let's say right. you know there's lots of different uh unethical types right. of thumbnails out there. like it's just so it's a good kind of goes back to that integrity thing but it's just i think that it's like the youtube thumbnail thing it is weird mm -hmm. but it's a part of society at this point totally yeah and it i like what you're saying it communicates what you're gonna see like there's nothing when i see those thumbnails that's a signal to me like i'm not the audience for that type of video so i think those thumbnails are useful because it's a signal to me like this is not going to be the format of video that i want to watch usually the whatever they might be i don't know i don't even know what my thumbnails in my algorithm look like but most of them aren't that <laughs> <laughs> so people get really obsessed with the idea of thumbnails with the idea of the perfect hashtag with the idea of all of this stuff and in business it's similar with uh, advertising like people go super deep on google adwords and super deep on you know their funnels for their offers and all this uh, detailed stuff and i actually think that it's kind of a cop-out both in business and in content creation and obviously those two things can be the same thing sometimes but it's like the way to become successful in business or content creation is to make good stuff that people want and everything else all of this like hyper optimization like yeah sure you can eke out 10 or 20 percent more by having a better thumbnail or a better whatever but really if you're just not good on camera and your content sucks, like there's no amount of optimization that you can do to help that. I think it's almost like um, it is the one thing that people can control and they can research. Like if somebody is not great at telling a story or they have a really annoying voice or whatever, mm -hmm. like they, uh, one, those things can be improved, but it's much easier easier to improve your thumbnail it's much easier to change that and i think people get too focused on that as like a crutch you know yeah i think it's uh it's the guild or the gilding you know like the uh, gilding the lily there's a saying where it's like you like have a very thin layer of gold on, on the outside of something right mm -hmm. when really that that's what it is a thumbnail and your ad words and your video title and things and I think that is really great gilding to great content. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't, cause I, I think just like a thumbnail and a video title, once I'm into the video, I'm not thinking about it anymore. Right. So this hyper fixation on that part of it is because it's your front door. Mm. And so you gotta, but focusing on the inside before you invite people in is mm. kind of important too, right? right? Yeah. So it is, yeah, it, it's a way to uh, get nerdy about like your perform like this is it's a way to su guarantee your success mm. in a way that uh or at least feel like you're guaranteeing success in a way that like sitting there and making a hundred videos that suck which is what it takes to make a good video mm -hmm. that you're just not gonna do mm -hmm. you know and also looking at your content critically also and admit because the people who are min maxing their uh, thumbnail and titles and AdWords and all that, they are not taking the, that the time that they're doing that is taking away from the time to sit down and look at your video and really ask yourself, mm. is this good? Right. Is this good? Would I watch this? Uh, it, like th those, those are the questions you should be asking yourself mm -hmm. before you go over and start working on those other things. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think, um, this happens a lot in the TikTok guru space. I I don't like really any of them, and I have more followers than almost all of them. <laughs> um, but uh, the which isn't that much even in the grand scheme of TikTok. But the these people who like give advice on how to make TikToks are doing the same thing that the YouTube thumbnailites are doing, where it's like, oh, your first two seconds have to have a hook. Hmm. And that's why you see so much content that's like, wait, wait, stop. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. Look at me, you know, like or just huge in your face type of stuff, which I think is an, a successful approach. But that so they're they're like insight is correct mm -hmm. that the first two seconds of your video need to be good. That's true. 
but their understanding of the effect of that success it's just a direct line mm -hmm. is just not true the way i think of it at least is that every two seconds of a tiktok the only goal is to make you watch the next two seconds mm. and then the next two seconds and when you can't convince someone to watch any more two second parts you need to stop the video interesting yeah and i think that people get wrapped up in kind of this traditional mentality of content creation not to go too far on the tangent but it's uh where it's beginning middle and end Mm -hmm. right where you make a video and it has a clear intro hey guys today we're going to be doing this some version of that maybe it has a strong hook you know have you ever wondered if and then you get into the middle of the content which is uh oh hey like here's how it works or whatever and then at the end it says okay guys like uh see you again or whatever just see and then you have your clear beginning middle and end this beautiful arc over your content but what you're realizing what you're not realizing is the context of that content, right? Mm. So how is someone going to see, especially a TikTok, right? It's in this huge feed. Uh, and there's this thing I always think about when I'm making content, and it's called the zone. And it's something that slot players experience. Mm. And it's something that slot machines are, and entire casinos are built in order to induce people into this zone where they are just, I'm sure you've seen the videos of the people just hammering mindlessly at the slots and they're doing all sorts of weird things. Those people are in the zone and they have a different goal than you when you go to the slot machines. They want to just get in the zone and get lost and lose time. Hmm. Whether that's sad or whatever, I'm not really here to judge, but the uh, they just want to get lost in the zone and just keep, and they actually don't like when they win hmm. because oh. it takes them out of the zone. Right, interesting. Yeah, so... Uh, that is like what you're doing. There's like a micro, I hope micro version of this that's happening when you're using TikTok mm -hmm. is you're scrolling and you almost don't even want to see a video that has a clear beginning, middle and end because the beginning of you watching TikTok was you opening TikTok mm -hmm. and the end is when you close TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. And you're in this huge, you're just in this endless session or this potentially endless session of watching TikTok. So your content has to live inside of that mm. and you have to find a way that you're so when you construct your content you need to ha understand that in front of it is it could be anything and after it could be anything and you don't even decide the end of your content because uh if you look at an amazing retention rate on a tiktok is i'd say 60 percent. that's great your video is going to do great right uh 60%. Well, 60% of the way through your video, you haven't gotten to your wonderful conclusion. Right. Your philosophy hasn't been completed. <laughs> right, right. You know, so you almost have to, I think of the, uh, uh, so I, I'm going all over the place, but I think of the inverted trying pyramid, I think in journalism uh -huh. where, Wait, what's that? Uh, in journalism, the, so I'm sure, are you familiar with the lead is the first sentence, right? Yes. That gives you everything you need. Spelled L-E-D-E, right? Yeah. You know, I learned yeah, that watch from out. the cross, mm -hmm. New York Times crossword. Yeah, yeah. With them recently. So, yeah, you have your lead. And that gives you the who, what, when, where, why, everything. Okay. And then it, the rest expands on that promise of the first sentence. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that has an amazing hook, you know, especially in an opinion piece, which is maybe usually not always in the inverted pyramid. But... It, but the reason that newspaper articles are constructed in this way is because traditionally, let's say that you're given a column and that you don't have a column. You're just writing an article for a newspaper. You're a freelancer, right? Mm -hmm. And you write up a 1600 word article for them. And OK, great. Thank you. Oh, shoot. They have to fit it inside of a newspaper that they don't know the full contents of, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you've constructed your work in the inverted pyramid where the least important thing is at the end and the most important thing is at the beginning. Okay. And the reason is so that they can lop the pyramid off at any point that they need to just to fill the space. Oh, we got to kill the last 400 words. Chop. They don't think about what is even there oh. because there's no beginning, middle, and end to a session with a newspaper in the same way. Interesting. Yeah, online things have changed a lot with the but that's still the way things are written is the inverted pyramid. I've never realized that. Yeah. Interesting. So and then it's kind of like self-selecting. So even if somebody only reads half the article, you know that you're going to have your most committed people are going to read to the end, but even the people who got bored halfway, like they got the meat of the content in the first half. Yeah. Interesting. And, and that's like how you build retention, I think, huh. is 
is usually it's like deliver a question and then a, and then answer on that question or, mm-hmm. or something some form of that is how I usually do it. Like, have you ever wondered how uh, your monitor even displays an image? Well, it, there's this very complex thing happening inside your computer, and then it has goes through this cable, like, and so. But I structure it. Most people order things chronologically, right? Mm-hmm. I usually structure things more most interesting to least interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So wow. if, if something cool happens at the end, like a cool image being displayed on your monitor, you start with that. That I think we would all know that part. Okay. But then let's say that there's you're learning because obviously I would have to research something like that to figure out how this complex thing works. And I see, oh my god, there's this really interesting thing that happens inside of a GPU that uh, deals with like encoding of a video it might not sound interesting but it sounds fascinating <laughs> yeah but um, <laughs> the nerds that follow me might find that interesting totally and so it's like wow video encoding has had this massive like renaissance recently and so maybe i can break down that part of it mm-hmm. and then say all those little bits and this is the mr rogers of it all i could leave out the cables mm. and the ports and the uh the actual like panel display how it works Mm -hmm. maybe i can make a video about those things later Mm -hmm. but trying to pack everything into one video you're just going to set yourself up for failure because that pyramid they're just going to chop when they get bored or when they learn what they wanted to learn and we've all done it i found this so maybe you've got some tips for me on how better to package podcast clips (laughs) on social media so i found that when i uh have a video that has two punch lines it hurts me in the algorithm because people Once they've gotten their first dopamine hit, they're out. So if it's like, I ask a question, they say something, I say something, punchline, then the the strong part of the video. And then as soon as they've gotten that first dopamine hit, they leave, even if there's an even better punchline 10 seconds later. Yeah, but how do they know? And they wouldn't, right? So, And I've caught myself, now that I notice that people do that on my videos, I'm paying attention to when I do it. And I'll notice that if there's like a clip and once I get my first dopamine hit, I'm out. I'm I'm on to the next one. I want so you you're saying you got to make sure that like you structure it to like make your best hit first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you've even seen it where probably you've seen videos where it starts with the punchline right. where you're like that's oh my god, so, you know, like and they're they and then the rest of the video provides context to the punchline that's at the beginning. Mm. You know, there's there's do, like that's the biggest thing is don't feel tied to being chronological if you're working on stream content mm-hmm. i would also watch a bunch of video game stream clips hmm. as well because that is incredibly honed content hmm. where uh that has like a clear payoff always and just like uh also since everyone's video game clips are essentially the same you and i talking it's kind of unique because it's us right when you're playing call of duty at the top level Everyone plays it essentially the same. So mm. what comes out of it is the format is what makes one piece of content about Wars, Call of Duty Warzone stand out versus another video is from the same way. Whether it's the way they're using, utilizing audio or maybe there's on-screen effects, that the way they use their text. These are the kind of like, like auteur level choices that you can make that are happening specific on the exact same essentially content Mm -hmm. where it's me winning a game of warzone Mm -hmm. or me like having a an interesting interaction with another player in warzone Mm -hmm. the way i'm obsessed with format i like when i think about like uh youtubers i like their content is almost in just inconsequential Mm -hmm. to the format one person that i really love is dank pods are you familiar Mm -hmm. with this guy he makes uh, headphone reviews, essentially, and another audio equipment and oddities. I saw you mentioned him in your uh, head, one of your headphone review TikToks. Oh, yes. Okay, so I know from that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he does these incredible videos that are exclusively from a top-down perspective, and it just shoot. He just shoots and he shows his hand. He does this great. Uh, he's a funny guy so he does these like vo sort of while he's reviewing the headphones look at this oh and when you listen to these headphones you feel this way but the format of the video where he is so compelling because you're literally just watching his hands holding things and the way he makes choices to incorporate things every once in a while he'll like review crappy headphones and bust them open how does he bust them open how would i do that i'd probably get a heat gun and 
pull it off and, you know, disassemble the headphone and let's see what's inside, guys. He just hits it with a rock <laughs> and opens it. That's a format level choice of, right. that he made. And it expresses his personality in a way that's unique. And it like the alter like the alternative, what I would do, looking at what he does, oh my God, I'm bad. Right. That's bad. What I thought I would do is just like wouldn't work. Yeah. And what he does works. Why and then you can break down why it works. It's fast, it's, it's funny. Uh, and it, it has a great visual breaking something. Mm -hmm. Now you look at that format, uh, and the benefits of the format that he's chosen. Now you can extract that part of it and then you can go over to your content and say, okay, how can I make the most boring part of my video faster and funnier and more visual? Mm -hmm. And then you have like a really, uh, I uh, one example, I guess I did have a top down video that was in some ways inspired by him was I did a review of headphones and I did a little VFX trick because you see a lot of unboxing style videos. Unboxing is a really hard category in my mind because everyone it's that everyone's making the same content. So how you your content is dictated by your format. So what I did was instead of opening the box and everything. I just unrolled a mat and I did VFX to when it unrolled the mat, everything was just already there. Nice. Yeah. A little cool little yeah, stick, right. a little eye, eye grabby. And so now you see everything laid out and I'm like, this has, I talk about the qualities of it, but I have eliminated the most boring part, which is opening the box. Right. Uh, there are other people who have different approaches to it where they do super smash quick cuts with hard angles and really cool of just like slicing open a box. And I've studied so many unboxing videos because it's just that same thing where it's like the format is uh, the medium is the message, right? Right. You're operating within the medium of a, an unboxing video. And so your message is constricted by the limitations of the things you have to do I within love that, that format. I love when like the idea of constraints I think is so useful for creativity. Like creativity exists within constraints. If there are no constraints at all, like there are ways to be creative there of course, but it's really fascinating to see if you give two people the same exact constraints, how they approach it is way more informative to me than if you gave two people a task of like, okay, create a 30 second video about anything. I'm not gonna learn much about them as opposed to saying, make me a 30 second unboxing video of the same set of headphones. You're gonna learn a lot more about the choices they make. Oh yeah, definitely. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, it's just like the, uh, yeah, the, that's like a classic thinking is like creative constraints help you because when you like the the kind of like that free form creativity is like the annoying version of creativity where it's right. like I'm creative I can think of like a bear riding a surfboard <laughs> right. I'm gonna make that a t-shirt and sell it because I'm creative and like that's yeah. my creative like outlet or whatever right and that was like a form of creativity for like a really long time the, right. the random I think that this is seen as like millennial humor now but uh like being random you know right 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 yeah uh, the um not to name names. But like the Jenna Marbles of the world, which right. I think she's actually a great content creator, but uh, I think she kind of plays in that space a little bit of just like the mm, uh, being weird and random is, right. is but yeah. Oh, I'm so, I'm so kooky. Look at me. Yeah. 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 Totally. Which is, I think it's easy to dump on someone like that, but I think sure. that she's found a really great audience and has, uh, I mean, staying committed as long as she was at things is really interesting. Uh, Cause I think she was on, she's retired from YouTube now, but uh, she was making like, a video a day you know and those video day type people are i mean a different breed of person I, i've gotten to meet a few of those like people who it's just like every single day i have to make a video or my day isn't complete and i think that those any all of those creators who are at that top tier uh five million ten million plus subscribers are like that where it's just like the their religion is content creation generation i think that like like making something part of their creative process is also it going live. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a lot of people are content to be creative, make their little puzzle or make whatever, do a painting. And then it getting shared with the world is not part of their creative process. I think that if you're a YouTuber, naturally you are the type of person who is inclined to think that publishing is part of the creative pro pro process. Totally. Yeah. That everyday thing. I know for me, the first time I heard that concept, 
uh, was from Casey Neistat. He made a video about like, here's how I got big. Was I, you know, every single day. And that was when his growth took off. I do think that that is, well, maybe it is still relevant. Uh, I've noticed that when people do that same uh, rule for themselves, I upload every single day to TikTok or Instagram or shorts, it doesn't carry the same weight as it did on YouTube. I could be totally wrong about this. I have no data to back this up. It's anecdotal. <laughs> um, I have some. I okay, worked, hit me. Am I, I wrong? I did, I did daily uploads for a really long time. Okay. And I found consistent growth. It made a big difference that. doing it yes, daily. Okay. definitely. But I think it's because people forget about you. I don't think it's uh, necessary. Like, you got to feed the algorithm and the algorithm is looking at you. Right. And like, you're just waiting for you to do something. I think it's more like, uh, more people will watch your stuff if you make more stuff. Like, I don't think it's that nuts. Right. Um... And also people slipping into your content stream, you'll come up more because you have more content. Like, mm -hmm. though, uh, I think that every day is, well, it's just what, whatever suits your content and your goals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you're a, uh, let's say, if you do video essays, mm -hmm. posting a video essay every day is, your, the content will suffer, but even if it didn't, I think that your audience, you're hammering the same brain every time you upload a video, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what you need to think of when you're making con generating content is that who is your video for mm -hmm. and are they going to be exhausted by you? Because mm. let's say that I make, I may, used to make these frame rate videos where I'd split down the middle and I could get, man, I could get like a million views every time I did it, right? It was mm -hmm. great. And then I started to see this drop off where just i was fatiguing my audience right? Uh, right and so i started to kind of occupy other lanes i think i thought of it as uh when i was first starting i thought of it as the kingdom mm -hmm. right so i had a, this is something i'm sure you've heard where it's like you do one thing on TikTok, and then you're that guy who does that thing right and for me that was frame rate videos and talking about frame rates right mm -hmm. so that was my castle at in the middle of my kingdom right and then of course, I could have this incredible tower, right? Mm -hmm. But that is like that's not very sustainable for a kingdom, right? Right. So I would start to kind of establish smaller little uh, pockets of my audience, right? Where I'm like, I'll do explainer videos, I'll do product reviews, I'll do uh, little things talking about like how technology works. I'll talk about uh, cables in the same way that I talk about frame rates. I'll talk about uh, uh, graphics and resolution in the same way that I talk about frame rates. And sometimes those videos would hit, sometimes they wouldn't, but I was establishing my kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Not everything is going to be the castle in the middle, right? but everything that the further I expand that the, my like outreach of my kingdom, the more protected my castle is. Mm. And that was the way I thought of it was the castle I can always go back to and retreat to. But the more I experiment out in this space, the, that doesn't weaken what's in the middle. It makes it stronger. Did you did you get fatigued making certain types of content? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because uh, on TikTok, I'm not really... It's hard being funny on TikTok and engaging and also educational and also... And those are like, I like being a funny guy. I'm like goofy. But there wasn't really, there's not really space for me to be too goofy. Because first of all, I am serving people's, like people say people have low attention spans. I don't think that's necessarily one to one. But I certainly, can, I am not in a place where I can demand a lot of someone's attention. I'm not famous. Mm -hmm. uh, my content's not bad, but it's not like, Mr. Beast, I'm going to fly a plane into a mountain. Good. Mm -hmm. You know, they could go watch that right now. Right. You know, they're choosing to watch my video. So I need to respect the amount of attention that they're willing to give me, mm -hmm. you know. So I can't, like, have a joke and education and uh, showcase my artistic ability and have cool VFX. Like, if you try and do everything, uh, even if you do a good job at everything, you are not meeting your viewer on the level that they want to meet you. Mm -hmm. So... What you need to do is just really respect their time and say what you got to say and get out. That's kind of like what I think of with my content. And so I became incredibly fatigued because I became a laser beam focused on just like, okay, deliver the information, get in, get out, SWAT team style. Right. You know? 
And that is incredibly fatiguing. Also, I wasn't making videos in the most healthy way. Uh, I would wake up at 6 a.m., go sit down, and I'm making a video. I'm starting right now. I'm writing the script. I'm setting up the camera. I'm shooting. And then by usually 9 or 10 a.m., I'm posted. Hmm. Yeah. And that was just the way... So it's three or four hours. So can we uh, drill in a little bit on what that process was like? So when you were doing the videos, you wake up at 6. Why that was that? Just like to impose self-discipline on yourself to feel like it was, or was this on a work day, like on a weekday? On a work day, yeah. I see, I, okay. That's why I had to post by nine. I see. Sometimes 10. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but I was usually good by nine. And okay. the way that I was so rigid was, first of all, I eliminated all friction in the production process. Okay. That was just something I ironed out really well, is I used this camera. I have it set to this way. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my content looks very samey, I think, it can, is a criticism of it, but it's because I had this really rigid production process. Is that a criticism? Is that bad? No, I don't think so. But people I People know, people will start to recognize you probably that way, right? I, I think, yeah, it's like you instantly recognize the format. It's your thumbnail. Right. On TikTok, there's no thumbnails, so the, the equivalent seconds, of your thumbnail. Yeah, become. And so if you see, oh, it's that guy, you know, if they suddenly see a top down video, then we'll recognize it. Right. I don't know how much people care about it's me. Like, oh, it's I like that guy. I hope watch his video. I don't think people do that as much as I think. I as think you that, wish. Yeah. I, that, yeah as, as I wish this happened. I think they're just like, cool video. Like, you right. know. Uh, and I think that, uh, so I, that was number one was, yeah, just getting my production flow down. I take, the, to the point where, okay, I shoot, I take the card from the camera. I have a docking station attached to my desk that I put the card in, unload the files into a specific file structure that my file structure was just, I would go, it was a folder structure that was year, month, day. Mm -hmm. And so I would just click into like, it's February 19, unload all the files, process it in. But yeah, so like that, having that set up, before I start thinking about like my philosophy and all that was really good because mm -hmm. when I first started making TikToks, I was just making as many video I thought of because I wasn't trying to be beholden to myself. I was just trying to learn how to make a TikTok. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I built out that structure. And once I during that process and I had that, then I could focus on concepting. Mm -hmm. And it's again, it goes back to the the creative process of insight idea concept execution mm -hmm. and so i would start the day usually from the day before maybe i'd read an article on the verge or i'd watch a really cool tech video about how they broke down oh they did this like cool x-ray effect i want to use that in a video just some kind of observation right mm -hmm. and then i take that and then i go into an idea how can i use that right oh maybe i could like show the inside of my phone and like motion track it and i could talk about uh, something inside the phone. Well, now I need to enter the concept phase, right? What am I going to talk about? Okay, well, I have the battery is really big in your phone, right? And when you see that x-ray, you're shocked by how much space it takes up. So maybe I can make a video where I talk about the how battery technology is actually lagging behind uh, all the rest of the technology in your phone, the camera, the sensors, the everything, right? And so... That that's the limiting factor on a phone right now. Well, now I have an entire concept and now I can go into execution. This is writing the script. This is refining my hook. This is building out the entire idea, talking about just the battery in my phone. And I, how did I start? I want to make a video where I uh, show an x-ray of a phone. Right. You know, and then I come do boom. I'm, I'm all the way at the end. And it's just like, if you're rigid about under, uh, about, what phase you're in because a lot of people like to go back mm. once you once you start going if you want to go back save that idea for another video interesting don't bother going back because you're starting over right yeah uh so the, the copy process so your background before being a creative director was a copywriter yes and in the agency creative world there is the uh copywriter which comes up with like the generally like ideas and concepts and what the message is going to be. And then there is the designer who's going to make the visuals and the graphics for those ideas. Am I getting that roughly right? I, well, usually a copywriter and a designer, at least the way I view it yeah. is it's a partnership. Okay. 
So I think that that's the real that's a really traditional way of looking at it. What you're describing is copywriter comes up with the idea, and then you have an art director come along, and uh, you know read the write up, and they talk about it, and then they come to a, a design, right? Mm -hmm. And then so you have the tagline on the movie poster was decided before the movie poster was designed, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the designer's job to like put that somewhere, but really. It's a creative partnership more so because a uh, like a copywriter thinks with language, and I think that a designer is a better almost all in all cases in my experience designers are better creatives than copywriters, hmm. uh, almost all cases, and it's because they can think spatially. Uh, I anyone can think of words. Whether those words are good or not is subjective, you know, but maybe a copywriter is better at thinking of words, but a, de a designer can sit there and come up with the word part of it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that good, but a copywriter cannot think, sp or no, there aren't many copywriters who are truly dedicated to that craft who can think spatially. Mm. I'm, I try and I'm trying to get better at when I think of a concept, thinking about, okay, what is the image looking what does that look like what is the most efficient way to deliver that information and if you can but so i think in the traditional route that or in a the modern route is that a creative it, it's always creative at least duos hmm. the working together it's not the copywriter comes up with the idea and then the uh designer works like executes in okay. production at least not anymore because I think that that's a really traditional way because the, of looking at it because design used to take so long. Hmm. So a copywriter solidifies everything and then a designer maybe does thumbnails and then the creative team goes over the thumbnails and picks one and then they execute. Well, now we don't have time to do that. Right. And so those things need to be happening in tandem. And the fastest way for that to happen is for there to be two brains working on every problem simultaneously. Hmm. Yeah. So with your background in copywriting your when you come up with a script for your video it's funny so you you mentioned that there are these different phases and then execution is like your last phase but there within that there are like a lot of sub phases in the execution right like so how do you how do you write your scripts? How, do you do oh, it yeah. real time? Do you improvise? How does it work? So uh <laughs> at least when both when I'm working on branded stuff and my personal stuff, for the most part, it is all scripted mm -hmm. to the point where I've used teleprompters a lot in my stuff. I hope people can't tell too much, but <laughs> uh, I try and. But the thing I've got, I have gotten pretty good at is I've always had this philosophy. I've been writing professionally for ten years now. I've always had this philosophy of you need to write like you talk and talk better than you write. Hmm. And so if you have those two goals, you'll be able to, while you're talking to someone, you're refining your point of view and understanding, like, because if I wanted to write this down, I it, I can't just be, like, umming and ahhing, which I do a lot of, but also uh, just, be, <laughs> I'm so self-conscious about it now. Uh, I am also interested in just communicating in a way that is worth writing down, right? Mm -hmm. And then also when I'm writing, I'm trying to emulate my voice, my point of view. And so it's just this constant process of growth that promotes growth as a writer, I think, is that if you can communicate someone with someone over text the way that you talk, that's really good. And then if you can then write a script that seems natural to the way you talk, both because you've been refining your writing to be the way, like the way you talk, but you've also been refining your talking to be like the way that you write. Mm -hmm. And so now those two things kind of like after a really long time, I think I've gotten better at having those things just be synonymous. So you can write in your own voice now. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so you've decided you're going to do a phone video. So the, the initial concept was it would be interesting to have an x-ray of the inside of my phone and I can track it visually. And then so you, you figure all that out, then you get to the execution. So is the first step of execution is writing the script? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Always I sit down with the script. Usually I have, I have an outline. I usually have sources that I reference. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I start, I think about what's my hook. 
What's the intro? I have like little things that I like to do that I've found have helped me be more successful, but I hate to give the like insinuate that this is how they're successful because it's how you get homogenized content. But I often like to start in the first sentence, have the word you in it. Interesting. Yeah. Just like there's a few little things like that. What else you got? I mean, what are your, what are your, what are your tips here? We can all um, steal some of these. You got use the word you. I like that. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the first thing, usually uh, pose a problem mm -hmm. and then immediately solve it. Oh, immediately. Yeah. So you don't wait to the end to solve it. Right. Cause you don't control the end of the video. Right. Yeah, uh, they do when they swipe. Right. And if you're taking too long to get the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm bored. Uh, so my thing is, but then in that second part, so like, have you ever wondered why your phone is so heavy? Well, it's because the battery takes up 40% of your phone. Mm. Boom. That's your call and response. But now you can pull them in a little deeper. That's your lead because people are like, wait, really? And yeah. then they're, they might stick around to figure out why is that? Yes, the okay. why is the substance of mm. your video. Uh, so the lead is the whole, it's the whole thing up front. Why is your phone heavy? Because of the battery. And then they might, their interest might be peaked and so they'll stick around. Yeah, and you jump, go from that straight into the content. Do not have any lead in or any, you just go straight to uh, talking about yeah, your battery is uh, your battery is so heavy because the only thing that it can make it work is, let's say, size. Mm -hmm. And so the, that's the only way that you can improve a battery is to make it bigger. And, and people are working on that. And maybe I could talk a little bit about like, but new technology implies that maybe someday we'll be able to make much like micro sized batteries that will last days and days. These, this is something that I would have surfaced in the research process mm -hmm. of, you know, having articles and links and things like that to just talk about how a battery works in your phone. And then when I, when I can't convince when I don't have any more interesting stuff, I, the video ends either. I do a lot of looping back Mostly because I, in part because I think it's fun to try and find an organic way to loop back to the beginning. Now you don't have to wonder why is you wonder why is your phone so heavy? Mm. You know, uh, just this fun tie back. But also a little heck is that it increases watch time by an incredibly small percentage. <laughs> because if you can trick someone into rewatching the first two seconds of your 15 second video, they have now watched a hundred and what is that 15% of your video? Mm. And so now your median watch time increase. There's like all these like little behind the scenes. That's, that's talking to the algorithm. Well, I think the algorithm does favor if somebody watches a video long enough for it to repeat, like if they hit completion on your video, I, I assume that that boosts it in the algorithm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. As and opposed to swiping away at 90%, like the difference between 99 and 101% is probably more significant than 2% of a difference in the algorithm, I don't know, taking that as a favorable. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, 99% to 101% is probably bigger than two to 4%. Right. Yeah, um, and so I, it's, but that's kind of like the way that I've always looked at it is, it, that's how I talk to the like algorithm is thinking about median, like median watch time right. and things, but yeah. Do you, so do you have your script locked in like you've written the script and you stick to it or sometimes when you're talking to camera you realize wait that's a little bit uh that doesn't flow well and you modify as you go yeah yeah yeah, definitely I, yeah the word salads i i write a lot of word salads occasionally because i overestimate my ability to just go through a sentence really and we write like what? word salad word salad it's a What's sentence that? it's a sentence that just has a too many words okay and, okay uh it's all mixed up and sometimes i'll uh I'll go in and edit things that are really small. I've been writing for a long time. So I, I like playing with things like, what if I use a different tense mm. here? And I'll do things that are incorrect, but more conversational, mm -hmm. like changing tenses, I think is something that I love to do. Uh, is like, I'll start a sentence in the present tense and then end it in the past tense just because it's fun and like, it's just, con it just it, making it that works. mistake. Yeah, I yeah. think it like, also there's something about, I've noticed, Way too many videos that I get served have a word misspelled in the little baked in caption they put. And it irritates me long enough to increase watch time. Like I just stew on it and I, I'm like, shit, I already watched 50% of this video just cause I'm pissed about this word being spelled wrong. Yeah, well, and I think that it also, um, I think that it's really, 
the overused term is genuine content. Mm -hmm. And so I think it kind of does increase the genuineness factor of a video if it's like, yeah, I just slapped the subtitles on there and or do you care? <laughs> you know, like, right. obviously you care. Right. But um, I think that the average viewer who's just trying to learn about how their battery works uh, in their phone sees that and they actually have a closer connection to you because they saw you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if they want to call it out in the comments, that's like, not only every I look at everything as opportunity. People would see that as bad. Oh my God, I made a mistake in my video and people are calling it out. Um, but everything is an opportunity. You can engage with them and make it a positive thing and say, "Oh man, yeah, I did miss that." Also, if they're in, if they're if they're commenting, that's good for your uh, engagement. Yeah, almost always, <laughs> right? yeah. Although I did have there was there was one instance that I really take as a uh, an example of the like negative power of the algorithm, hmm. where I the the cardinal sin of being on the making stuff on the internet is not being wrong is being slightly wrong <laughs> right okay. i um referred so the bottom of a playstation disc is black and i went into why and i did some did a lot of research and saw that some people were saying that it was because it was copy protection okay this is very niche I'm talking about it. Oh, copy protection is like, uh, and I guess it kind of was in a way. And I talked about it in a video. Uh, and then it's actually, it's not a form of copy protection. It was a form of branding, I think was what they, people landed on. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I personally think it was both because I don't want to get into it. I'm just <laughs> arguing with internet commenters in my head right now. But uh, what happened was a specific type of person started to comment mm. the tech nerd who likes to be right likes to correct people and then what happens when that type of person comments um it gets served to another person in that same category mm. and then those people are loving my video right mm -hmm. because they love to be haters right and that video had tons of views and i people were literally calling me hitler wow <laughs> and i felt horrible all day and it was just constant i mean thousands of comments about this but you got uh, it was obviously a high performing video yeah i think it went over a million views yeah yeah and uh but see i don't gauge views i'm not even in the partner program on tiktok i think mm -hmm. if i was i'd be a little richer but i'm not because i'm scared of it you know right. i've heard lots of rumors that they uh deprioritize your views if you're in the partner program i don't think that's true anymore I, I i never now i don't think that was ever true now but back then it was just scary to submit yourself to that right. potentiality right because what i liked was learning i use what i learned for work obviously but also i like making things on the internet and if i tried to make money off of it then I'm staying awake at night thinking I should be making Mr. Beast videos. I should say, be like, I crashed my car 10 times to see what would happen or something. Totally. Because there's more money in that than making videos about, hey, this TV is kind of cool. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you have any thoughts on where you may create in the future? Like, so you're well acquainted with TikTok. You know that really well. And obviously through your day job, you are well acquainted with the other platforms. How would you approach creating for, let's say YouTube differently? Or would you, is that not something you're oh, interested in? Oh God, no. No? The YouTube hustle is crazy hard, first of all. Uh-huh. Uh, Cause it's essentially, you'd still be making, I'd still be making TikToks, posting them in shorts, trying to gain viewers and also make long form content. I've always thought about making long form content. And if I was gonna approach it, I would want a really, really strong, peer, strong, narrow point of view. Totally. Yeah. If I wanted to, like if I was gonna make a tech related YouTube channel, let's say, I think I would exclusively make it about, let's say, portable monitors. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to become the world's leading expert on portable monitors. I'm importing them from China, getting the latest models. I'm trying out e-ink portable monitors. Oh, this could be the one that saves your life and changes your whole workflow. I'll do small ones. I'll do big ones. I think I would just exclusively focus on something so incredibly narrow that maybe people aren't like really focused on. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe I would start to realize from my audience, you know who's really in my audience? People who travel a lot, mm -hmm. right? 
So now I have an audience in mind, people who travel, the digital nomad types. So then I can start maybe reviewing backpacks mm. and say, here's everything I carry in my backpack. I love backpacks too. I have like four or five of them. Now I can talk about like, oh, this has this like cable management. I'm making long form videos about that. That's the kingdom is or the, the castle is my portable monitors. Mm -hmm. But then the kingdom is all this stuff for maybe travel people. Maybe for some reason makeup YouTubers love portable monitors because they can set them at their makeup stand and they run off a of battery. And so now maybe I could find some way to appeal to someone uh, teching out their makeup. Like it's just there's lots of avenues for that to build outward. Mm -hmm. But off of that one castle. What has... And also we don't have to go deep into the... Uh like mental health aspect of it, but maybe more topically, when do you find yourself in the creative process, like bummed out or challenged? Cause there is a certain, like, no matter how much you try to avoid it, you post something and it doesn't do well. It does hurt your self-worth. <laughs> yes. Uh, when I get three bad videos in a row. Okay. <laughs> that exact moment I go, I fall off. Everyone hates me. <laughs> right. You know, uh, it's when I personally, I, I, I think I'm really lucky in that I don't feel that way about my professional work, but mm -hmm. I do really feel it heavy about like when I'm making something, I'm not making it for money. I think that there's a lot of solace that people find in their work where, uh, in their like job where they go and it's like, well, the goal is in some ways to make money. Mm -hmm. But now when I'm making TikToks, is the goal to get views? Is it for people like me? What's my goal on TikTok? Mm. I just kind of want to make things. I don't know. Uh, but all, but at the same time, I feel bummed out when a video does bad. So clearly that is I'm aligned with that that goal of getting views. So that really does kind of cause anxiety in me, especially um I have a bad history with like making branded content outside of a few uh, people. Like I've made a few branded content. We'll send you a thing videos. Uh, and I'm honestly quite, uh, I, I get a lot of anxiety around making those to the point where I'll just put it off and put it off. Uh, and I don't even really fully understand why. Interesting. Do you, I, I'm going to be a little, armchair expert kind oh, of let's like go. make make pretend psychologist is it maybe because there are stakes all of a sudden right like if it's just for you then there there are no stakes other than your ego whereas when it's for a brand all of a sudden like you are being measured on performance in a much more real way like you have somebody else to let down i don't know that must i think it could be part of partly that way uh and it's just like if a video does if a branded video does bad, that's something also I can't like send, be like, I've done a successful branded video before, right. you know, I have, a, I have a few, but what about my most recent one? That would have did bad, you know? Right. Uh, and I, I get a lot of anxiety around that. Uh, yeah. The, like per, that video's performance, I'm sure that's part of it, right? Is that mm -hmm. video's performance kind of, now someone is literally judging me based on the performance and also they're relying on my video to do well because they convinced someone to either send me product or pay me mm -hmm. to make a video about a product. And they said, this is a good idea. I need to deliver on that promise that they made to someone else. And I also have no insight into they are a black box, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people are reviewing these videos. I don't know what their metric of success is. I don't know how what their experience with social media is. Are they only seeing like my daughter loves so, uh, TikTok? Let's get a TikToker. Uh, what my daughter shows me these videos that get forty million views. Where's the forty million views? There, those people exist, and they are in high up places in the world of marketing. At some right. of these like more especially like the niche tech companies that have money to spend on influencers but maybe don't have the insight into the social media world you mm -hmm. know so it's just like i get a lot of like ah you know freaked out by that right yeah i guess i don't know how you gotta make peace with that at some point if you're uh <laughs> ever gonna I, and, and working on the other side mm -hmm. of the fence on the branded side where i'm working with i've worked with influencers of big and small uh and What's interesting to me is that, first of all, the people who said it was a good idea to bring you on want you to succeed mm. because it makes them look good. Right. And so it's all, something I had a friend who is, was asking me about for uh, an influencer friend who was asking me about like 
what are you guys doing in there when you ask me to make content? What do you expect from me? And honestly, what I want is your video, you to make a video and post it. And then it's my job to convince the peop the powers that be in some capacity. It's my job to convince them that it was a success hmm. because like, oh, maybe it didn't perform as well as all your other videos, but it got views to a new audience that we didn't have. That's part of the reason that we pit select, would select someone is because we see their audience and go, oh, they're like making a cool thing for a group of people that we would like to think we're cool. Right. So let's work with them. And so uh, when that video goes live, if it underperforms, I, I, I told them, just don't worry. It's somebody else's job to make that look good. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it feels like it's your whole world when it's you making the content, right? And you don't realize this is, you're one influencer out of 40 in this <laughs> yeah. massive campaign. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, being, so you're not from LA originally. Oh, correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, when did you move to California? I moved to California. Bleh, I moved to California in 2015. Okay. Uh, yeah, I moved. So I guess I've been here seven years. Is that eight years? But it was. Uh, yeah, I moved here to be a games journalist, a video game journalist. Interesting. Yeah. So you didn't have a group of friends from high school or college that was out here. So you had to make new friends, basically. And this is something I've been talking to a lot of people about, like how the heck do you make friends as a grown up? Like, how do you navigate that being, you know, not any more new to here, but how have you built out your social circle? Do you still see your friends? Oh, wow. Um, I met a lot of my friends through work. I figured, my, yeah, yeah. yeah, my closest friends, you know, we are in the trenches together. And uh, now it's just like about keeping up with them. Mm -hmm. Is uh, the people that I used to work with, I've worked at, there are people who I'm incredibly close with. We play video games every week who I worked with at a company, I guess, five years ago, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've all parted ways. We've all gone to se several different places, but it's like, we all just stay committed. Mm -hmm. That's I think number one mm -hmm. is staying committed to the people that you're, uh, that you're like, that are your friends is that is that insightful <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like be a good friend is how yeah. you be a friend no, uh, how do you stay committed what do you guys like do you have a standing like trivia night date or what every tuesday we play i play the f1 video game with my friends nice. we're in a racing league and i let me tell you as far as like friendships go this is one of the ones to be jealous of all right we're there's eight of us uh maybe nine and we all get on this game every Tuesday and we talk shit to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we also all watch F1. So maybe there was a race that weekend. We catch up and talk about what happened in the race. So we it's like it's like going out to a bar, mm -hmm. except way cheaper. Right. <laughs> and uh, you can drive. You don't have to drive home at the end. Right. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it's just like and. We have a league set up every week. It's there's stakes where it's like, if I beat you, I'm ahead of you in the whole overall league. So it's like, I can't miss a week. Right. But not because we would give each other shit or like it would be, we'd be letting each other down. It's because my points, I'm going to be giving up 20, potentially 25 points on the league. Right. And so I got to have a great reason to miss a Tuesday night. Yeah. Wow. That's clever. I haven't heard that before. That's nice. Yeah. So that's what we do. And we, we, we have a lot of fun doing it. There's been people who have been like, Oh, I'd love to join you guys. And it's like, I'm, I don't know how to say this. We're not taking applications. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You, Cause dude, it's so so delicate it feels like right because if we introduce someone how, you can't unintroduce someone right right like hey we're kicking you out of the league that's way harder than just <laughs> denying admittance yeah yeah i'm sorry yeah uh come out the drinks with us every once in a while you know right maybe. We, we, this is a slow pro you want to go to the major leagues of friendship right now <laughs> right, right especially since you never know how someone plays video games oh interesting yeah dude i mean how many times has it happened i, I played uh dota this incredibly intense team-based game mm -hmm. and totally mild man people oh i play dota oh my god we should play together and you get on with them and they're like raging at their teammates and yeah. you never would know that they're that type of gamer right yeah so it's like that's like a uh that's it, it's a really rich system that we have that we like to keep siloed. So that's how we segment yourself into a cloister is my advice for how to keep your friends, I guess. 
What do you, so on the video game front, so uh, I am not much of a, I'm not a gamer. So I, it, when I was younger, like 14 or 15 or something, I played a lot of Wolfenstein. Uh, oh. Return to Castle Wolfenstein. I was in a clan. We did, I was like in it, heavy Damn. there. And then in high school and college, I was into Halo 3 on Xbox 360. I played that a lot with my friends. It was mostly just like, hyper aggressive just like me and my friends like almost coming to like fist fights over games oh yeah but since then i haven't done much gaming at all what if i or someone was gonna get back into gaming what's like a good entry point like what are oh wow um you know i think You'd be amazed at the variety of games. I, there's a lot of people who say I don't play games, mm -hmm. and uh, I, you haven't, you just haven't found your game yet. All right. There's a million billion different types, but I think if I was going to tell someone who's been out of gaming for a long time, mm -hmm. if you want to see what gaming can do right now that you've never seen before, is to play a game called Stardew Valley. Okay. It is this rich game where you play as a farmer. This is a this is an old format of a game. It's Harvest Moon is this type of game. But you're a farmer and you live in this town. You've inherited, I believe it's your grandfather's farm, and it's in disrepair. And you need to go out, plant in the fields. It's a 2D, very simple pixel art kind of game. You There's lots of things you can do. You can go into the mines and go and mine and find gemstones to build things. But... Again, whatever is in your brain, simplify it. It's a very simple game if you're thinking of comparing it to the Call of Duties of the world and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's beautiful in its simplicity because it allows you to the experience the best part of the game, which is the intense interpersonal connections of the people who live in this town. Oh. And so you are a newcomer to a town and you can go and you can talk. You can build relationships with the people that you like in the town. They have incredibly varied, uh, I'd, I'd say that they're maybe fall into tropes, they're archetypy, but you will find yourself falling in love with maybe two or three certain characters. You can romance them and eventually marry mm -hmm. characters. And uh, it's just like, you start to like build this digital life in this game that you become very attached to. And then also it's not, uh, geared to being addictive. It's mm. a relaxing sort of experience to play this game. Uh, and I think that that is, has been an entry point for a lot of people into video games that maybe said, I've never played a video game. I wouldn't play video games. It's a waste of time. You're suddenly going in and you're being like, I got to water my crops and then I got to go into town because there's a festival and I want to go and give a gift that I've been growing for the past two weeks to the person that I want to romance hmm. and see what that interaction is like. And it's just like that experience is, I think uh, it's just so re such a rewarding feedback loop mm -hmm. in a way that isn't exploitative of your time. Mm -hmm. So you went to college in North Carolina. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then uh, what was the story of moving to LA? Well, when I graduated from college, I uh, moved into a house in the mountains with a uh, a woman who was very kind to enough to rent me a room in her house for $200 a month, which is about as much as I could afford. At the time, I was working at the airport selling sandwiches. All right. And it was a sick job. I got to meet a lot of celebrities because everybody flies, uh, you know. Uh -huh. uh, and I kind of really did like it. I just were, I, you know, you see that guy who's like this at the kiosk. That guy was me okay. uh, working at the regional, very small airport in Asheville, North Carolina. And I uh, did that for two years. And at the, simultaneously, I was writing uh, as a games journalist for free. I was essentially a hobbyist. Uh, and every once in a while, that would afford me opportunities where I get like, oh, I got to play the PlayStation 4 early. And like, oh, this is a dream come true. But really, I'm committing labor for free. But I'm cutting my teeth. I was not a, I didn't go to school for journalism. I went to school for new media art. So I had to learn this new craft. And so I really committed myself to it. And for two years, I worked at the airport and uh, simultaneously wrote. And then I got a job at uh, at EGM writing uh, for this magazine that I read when I was a kid. Now, it maybe had didn't have all the luster that it had when I was growing up, but it was still a full-time job in games journalism that gave me a salary. 
except it was in Los Angeles. So in one week, I just gave I threw a party and gave away everything I owned, essentially packed up my car and just drove across the country in three days. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was really intense. I even worked my last week for some reason. I because like I don't know. I didn't know anything about jobs, you know. Right. So I just thought I gotta. I, I, I'm sorry. I can only give you one week's notice because yeah. I need to be there in a week. Right. Is that okay? And they're like, uh, okay, fine. Work a full week. That's great. Right. You know, that's like, good. This isn't a law firm. Like it's it's one week is more weeks than what you normally get. <laughs> yeah. Usually people just quit right um but i was like no quitting's bad i wish i i well it was kind of fun because it was just like this nutso thing and uh i drove across the country i kind of went insane i was like re i had about 200 dollars in the bank account uh -huh. at the time uh it was like really kind of frightening and i went to this store that sells like expired food what? <laughs> yeah that, is that expired legal? food store i was somehow that must have been legal wow. right but uh I think because it, we all knew it was expired, right? right, right. They weren't selling meat. It was like <laughs> right. it was like expired sweet tea and stuff. And uh, I remember just like dipping bologna into mustard and just eating it while I was driving wow. and just drinking this gigantic sweet tea and like just pouring sweat because <laughs> my car, the AC didn't work. And I, I drove across the country and I made it to LA and I live essentially in my car for a month. Wait, did you actually live in your car? Yeah, well, I would stay with people. Uh, it's a, a few people who were like really gracious to like, I never want to overstay when I welcome, you know? So were there nights where you slept in your car? Mm -hmm, a couple. I, and also I stayed at, here's a piece of advice is never Google cheapest hotel in Los Angeles. All right. You will find it. And it looks, it looks like where you go to get like the first mission in GTA. Okay. It's like, yeah, it's just like, literally it's like, I'm going to go meet someone and do crimes here. Uh, and it, so that was a very bizarre experience. Like better to stay in your car than that. Probably. Yeah. I was all, oh, but I was terrified of getting robbed, right. staying, <laughs> sleeping in my car. I slept yeah. in like Walmart parking lots, which is the, the hack. Okay. Uh, you sleep in the 24 hour Walmart parking lot and they don't mess with you if you're not messing with anyone. Right. And so, uh, did that for a while because I had to get up this money. I remember, I, but I, and so I, then I got my uh, first job in games journalism and it was, I guess the rest is history. I remember I got my first paycheck and I opened it and then immediately closed it because I was like, oh my God, this is more money than I've ever gotten in my whole life. Do you remember how much it was? It, uh, I can't remember how much it was, but I was making 35,000 a year. Okay. Which is not quite enough to live right. in Los Angeles. Yeah, after tax, that's gotta be like, a, I don't know, like a thousand something bucks, right? Yeah, but at the time I was used to living off $10,000. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. uh, like a year. Yeah. So uh, it was actually great for me right to be like a huge bump up i was yeah. like i remember being so proud that i could uh go to subway anytime i wanted right i could go to subway if i want subway today i can go get it if i don't want subway i don't i don't go get it it's like up to me like that's I, funny okay so that was my goal um when i was younger is like i want to be able to get a starbucks and not have to think about it right like and that's to this day it makes me feel rich when I can just go to Starbucks because I want to get a Starbucks. <laughs> like I think it's probably important to keep your perspective on these things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. That's um, cool. So you're still you foot long whenever you want now. Yeah, no I, big well, deal. I yeah, uh, I'm living that life, you know. Oh, that's fine. It's the good life. Uh, yeah. What careers do you really emulate? So that's where you came oh. from. Who would you? Uh, like to emulate in your career would you like to see like mr rogers type what would oh, be yeah i want to become mr rogers <laughs> Why not? uh actually there is a guy who i've essentially uh i've always felt like i was like behind him in terms of my career he's mm -hmm. very very successful but uh he's like an aspirational figure to me and it's this guy named jeff rubin okay and he had a podcast where he just talked about video games. He's kind of an early adopter of that, but really he found a success working at College Humor in like the golden era of College Humor. This was many years ago, like 10 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. And he kind of then went on to work at BuzzFeed in the heyday of BuzzFeed. And he's kind of someone who has been able to make things on the internet and make a career out of it. And it's like, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Rubin is just someone who I've always like been a big fan of. I think I, I had a parasocial relationship with him for sure. Uh, and he, now he works at YouTube, I believe in gaming and he works on that side of, which is gaming is the largest category on YouTube. It's hmm. a very aspirational career. Sure. Uh, yeah. So it's, I, 
guess if I'm going to like look to someone's career, I think a lot of people look like would say Elon Musk or, you know, those people who are just like so incredibly successful, either financially or professionally or whatever. Right. Right. But that is in reading their biographies, reading biographies that other people write about them, reading articles about them and kind of getting inspired. I think there's value in that. But if you're really I I find that it helps me be re realistic when I'm looking at those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, like, I want to be Mr. Rogers. What a noble pursuit. I want to be the next Bob Ross right. of tech videos. Like, well, fun. I mean, sick. <laughs> Bob Ross didn't like his job. It's, oh, I've heard this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was like, it was like his fallback. He didn't really, like, he wasn't crazy about it. I think eventually he came around to it. But for a long time, he, like, resented that that's what made him successful. Yeah, I heard, I'm not sure how true this is, but I heard that he wanted to change his hair, but they wouldn't allow him. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he actually did not like the fro, and he wanted to just be a normal whole hair, I Regular guess. dude, yeah. Yeah, but could you imagine? Right. Although I'd love, see, I'd love to see Bob Ross in the modern era, because it would be like, Bob Ross has a new hairdo, it'd like, it'd be a big deal. Dude, no, it would be like seeing a shaved poodle. It would be uncomfortable. I wouldn't. Oh, you didn't like it? <laughs> I don't know. I'd love to just see he goes bald. <laughs> Welcome to the joy of painting, yeah. Yeah, Bob Ross with cancer, that would be dark. Oh, oh wait, he didn't have to have died? cancer. I'm going to cut that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know who, uh, so uh, uh, Casey Neistat had a similar path that he talked about on his channel for a long time where it's like he wanted to be a serious filmmaker, right? Like he had that HBO show and then he just wanted to be like, you know, an auteur, uh, Woody Allen. Like, I don't think he ever said Woody Allen, but like he wanted to be, a filmmaker like that. And then he, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing, but I think his videos have suggested that he was somewhat uneasy or resentful. Resentful might be too strong of a word, but wasn't crazy about the fact that YouTube was the thing that made him huge. And I think he's come to terms with that now and is very grateful for it. But that seems to be pretty common that a lot of artists are, uh, they don't have the path that they think they're going to have. But in retrospect, the thing that they did didn't have the respect that it deserved in the time because it was too early, because it was trailblazing. But then that ends up making them like legends and pioneers, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it's uh, the grass is always greener, right? Totally. You yeah. know, I think that's it boils down to that. Right. I remember I always said. I just, I'm doing this until I, and if it doesn't work out, I'm just going to go get a union job screwing bolts on cars. Right. I'll do whatever it takes to do that. I don't know what it takes. I'll probably go to uh, like a community college and do that. Yeah. And then in two to four years, I'm screwing bolts on cars, you know, mm -hmm. that's a, that I just always thought about it like that. When this stops working, I go and screw bolts on cars Right. and that's my life. And that's a very good life, you know, mm -hmm. that I would be proud to live. But for now, this is like weirdly working, right. uh, using my brain to like make things for the internet is how I think, I, I think of, that's how I think of like my career is I make things on the internet. Hmm. Doesn't have to do with social media, mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with uh, writing or anything like that. I make things that go on the internet. To add to the tapestry. Yes, the tapestry, the very pretentious <laughs> hey, thought. Hey, did you like that callback? I, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I, that's the whole, that, so, but once that, well runs dry i think i would be naive to i i don't i, I don't think it will ever run dry but i would the be internet naive. yeah <laughs> yeah there's probably got a little momentum there you'd be all right <laughs> yeah yeah but i'd be naive to think that it couldn't go away i think sure sure because we've seen lots of things that we thought could never go away go away and come back you know lots of things come back but like i think i'm obsessed with video games so uh, there was actually a big video game boom in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the Atari was huge, and it was this gold rush, and there were lots of people making all sorts of games. And there actually was a big video game crash in the 80s that uh, made it so that no one was making a video game, no one was investing in video games. We've heard this in other categories. The automotive industry had happened where there was a whole collapse, and it was like, are we are cars even going to be a business anymore? Right. You know, it was like nuts. And uh, then... There's always an innovator who comes back and brings it back to life, mm -hmm. right? Well, I think that if there were a four-year period where the internet fell out of favor, whether it's because infrastructure explodes, uh, you know, or maybe public just loses interest and moves on to something else. We go back to linear television for some reason, you know? Right. I, I, it could happen. Who knows? Something. Yeah. yeah. And so at that point, I need to accept that 
this is I don't really make anything. <laughs> I don't my skills mm. are not if I could repair your air conditioner. Right. I mean, I'm set for life. Like truly, this is th these types of jobs now because everybody wants to be a YouTuber, right? Like that's why people who repair air conditioning make two hundred thousand dollars a year now. Yeah, it's yeah, I th and I think that is an aspirational lifestyle for sure. Right? You know? uh, it's my ah. Uh, I'm gonna try and summon what my uncle does, but I think he does something with air conditioners and he has a very nice life and a very nice house and a big yard that he loves to mow. Yeah. And it's like, that's sick. Did that's you ever watch Community? A sick lifestyle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember, uh, I can't remember which season it was when John Goodman runs the air conditioner. Oh yes, school. yeah. And it runs, that's like the whole, that's <laughs> Profit like the- center for the whole yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh I I like, I think that I've always, I think that having, I think, uh, Having like a little bit more humble beginnings has helped me uh, come to terms with the reality that it can all go away. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of people who like were, feel like they were destined for like this job where it's like I can go into an office and I just make things on the Internet or I just make I, I just work in this category and that's going to be my career. I work in social media forever or mm -hmm. I work in advertising even forever. Uh, but it just seems like. Uh, having that baseline of I can always go back to something else right. is very comforting to me and helps me get through the hard days where it's just like, if it's ever really, 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 really hard, I can just quit and go air conditioner repair. Route. Right. What's your, your plan B? That's uh, everybody's got a plan B and a plan C and a plan <laughs> yeah, D that makes you feel better so. about it for sure. What is your unique value? Why have you been promoted to, a pretty impressive title at a pretty young age and you've been oh. able to build a following like this is i'm i'm uh, it's i'm asking you so don't feel like you're going to sound arrogant by answering but what is it you think that is your unique value proposition in the way that you would be able to find something else if video games went away i don't think that you would stop doing creative work oh yeah well i think uh I've stayed committed to, if I'm going to be down brass tacks about it, I could talk about myself or something, but I think if I'm going to say what it was, was I committed myself to a category. Okay. Video games. Mm -hmm. That is a, that is a core focus of mine. I love video games. I've been playing them my entire life. I don't plan on ever stopping. I don't, they have never gotten less interesting to me. Hmm. And this is a category that I'm so passionate about. I will do anything in the realm. Like working in advertising for video games is really an honor for me. I love that I get to do it because it is just like promoting and getting people to play more video games is positive to me because I respect the medium a lot. The people who work in this industry are incredible. The people who make games who are sitting there working 10, 12, 14 hour days crunching for endless amounts of time. It is an honor to get to present their work to the world. Hmm. And I just love this industry and everything that it represents. And I've committed myself wholeheartedly to the point where I'll be in interviews and for like, I'll do an interview and it'll be go to go maybe work on a car brand, let's say. And I'm interviewing and like, oh, well, you really only have experience in video games. And I tell them, yeah, because that's the most important thing in the world to me. I'm very honest about. A lot of people are interested in diversifying their portfolio and getting lots of different things. I don't want to be the guy who does this because I don't know. So I don't want some stigma attached to me. That's not who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not video. The guy who works on video games. I'm a guy who works in advertising for video games. You know. So I try not to let that uh, define me. I think that's what people are afraid of when they. But I think it's all about finding that thing that you are willing to commit to really, really hard and then finding a lane in that space that you can work. Hmm. Cause I think that the easy conclusion is, Oh, I want to be, I want to work in video games. I got to make video games. You know, uh, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would be good at it. I just have no clue and I don't really have the means to explore that. And so what I do instead was find advertising for video games that so like the advertising thing is like secondary but it's work that you're good at work that you can be that you can contribute to like the work itself is something that you 
are good at it's like the the ikigai circle of like the thing that you uh uh enjoy doing that oh god i'm not gonna be able to say it all at once have you seen this before the ikigai circle it's like um no it's uh it's a venn diagram with four circles and it's the thing that you are good at the thing that you enjoy doing the thing that you can get paid for and the thing that the world needs and where all the different circles intersect they're like one of them is a hobby and one of them is a vocation and one of them is an occupation or something the middle is ikigai it's basically where all four of those things meet so it's like if you enjoy doing something, but you're not any good at it, it's not going to work. If you enjoy doing something and you're good at it, but the world isn't willing to pay for it, then you've got yourself a great hobby. Mm -hmm. And basically, you have to find the confluence of all four of these things, and it's hard to find. And I think people get distracted by liking an industry. So I love cars. I've always loved cars since I was a little kid, still do. I thought I wanted to work in the car industry for a long time. And thank goodness I figured out before I went down that path that there are, that I know of, there aren't careers in cars that line up well with the type of work that I like doing, the type of work that I'm good at. Like, I don't think there are any jobs at an automotive manufacturer that I would be good at. Uh, a car dealership is definitely not like- <laughs> That's not working in cars, right? <laughs> but then, but people, I think, get confused about that where it's uh. like, I like video games, so I want to make video games, but the process of being a coder for a video game is like, has probably basically nothing to do with playing a video game, right? Like yeah. they're very, <laughs> where those things intersect is very small. So I think it's really good advice to say, find the thing that you love, find the thing you want to commit to, and then maybe just as important or more importantly, find the lane in that where you can contribute effectively right and which for you is working in the advertising space yeah and i also was always willing to change mm. i was a games journalist for three years two of which were unpaid and then one year it was and i got my dream job what i thought was my dream job but uh it just wasn't it didn't have that growth mentality to me that job it just it just I wasn't growing in a way that I wanted to at that mm -hmm. job. So I actually went and developed TV shows hmm. at the company that makes the show Catfish. Wow. <laughs> yeah, for two years I did that. Uh, and I was part of a really great team and I learned a lot of things. Never made a single show. Made a couple pilots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I made, yeah, just like unscripted TV shows. And I tried to do it about gaming as much as I could. And like, but... It's like you said, there was, the world didn't have a demand for a gaming linear TV show on MTV mm. where we break down the lives of esports pros, you know? Mm -hmm. And also I was asking myself, is that really, do I want to be on season seven of that show or whatever? Because right. that's the fantasy. If you make a show, your dream is for it to go to like season seven or 10 or whatever. Uh -huh. And is, is that my dream? I don't think so. So uh, I was laid off from that company. Uh, because of they just had a big layoff and honestly it was a I was really bummed it was a blessing in disguise and then I got into advertising and I found out especially social media uh, working on the game Destiny 2 and it was like uh, I was working at an agency on Destiny 2 and it was like whoa I didn't even know this was a category of job you could have in gaming right. and what's really nuts is no one at the time really viewed that as a job working in gaming they thought of it as advertising mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. You work on advertising and you just happen to be advertising a game. But right. to me, I was like, I work in the games industry, you know? Right. And so like that, being able to kind of like uh, romanticize my own job like that, especially at the beginning was very helpful. Totally. All right, man. Well, we've, uh, we've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, anything else that you wanted to touch on before we call it? Um, be good to one another. <laughs> All right. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what, what makes you say that? Oh, yeah. Be evil to one another. What if I said that? <laughs> <laughs> what makes you say that? Uh, I don't know. I just think that it's like, uh, I feel like that's a professional tip that's just not given enough. <laughs> mm. Okay, wait, hold on. We're not, we're not done because there's, I got something on this. Um, there, I think, I would assume in the industry of the, the, the creative agency industry, there are people who are very ambitious and cutthroat and i don't I, this is in any industry so i just mean to say every industry has people like this but 
it also seems like a short-term game versus the long-term game of, hey, let's treat each other with respect and build relationships. And how has that, the idea of just being kind to one another, uh, have you seen that manifest in weird ways in your industry? It makes my day-to-day -day easier. All right. <laughs> this is all it is. I, if I'm being nice to people, it's just so much easier than being mean to people. I've seen people get yelled at in my industry, and it just never felt necessary, you know? Right. People get real mad, especially when I, I, when I worked in TV. I saw people get yelled at insanely tough and also heard even worse stories of people getting, like, chewed out and it just being like a play of like power and things where it's like i've i've heard of this is not for i didn't see this happen firsthand but i've heard stories of like on set people being in working reality tv and the person being too nice the per, the executive producer being too nice and so it's like on the phone they were told you need to go and get a pa and yell at them in front of everyone whoa i've i've heard that that has happened in this industry at least one time right uh and so it's like there's this mentality that a mean boss is a good boss. I think it's that still lingers around or like that you need the pecking order needs to be super clear and that can lead to a lot of disdain. And it's just like, if you're just honest and nice, I don't know. That's like really, that's a good place to start. I think for, I think you said it best since like a long term plan. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. It's, and also, what what is the when you work for an organization that either encourages or allows that type of behavior? It's like, is that how you want to spend eight hours a day for your life? That's yeah. miserable, man. Oh, Screw that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and that's such a galvanizing moment for like everyone who doesn't like you. <laughs> Because right. people are, you know, it's very easy to fall into the trap of trying to find a reason to hate someone. And if you see someone <laughs> yell at somebody, oh, my God, I hate that guy. He right? sucks. And it just doesn't seem I just don't see the gain. I don't know. Maybe there is some gain in like I do respect people who yell at people, maybe somewhat. Because <laughs> uh, it's like, damn, that guy's really intense. Uh, and also there is the I don't want to get on his bad side. Uh, totally. And I think that's the shorthand. Right. of it right if you're a producer and you need someone to do something right now the best way to ensure that they do it right now forever is to yell at them i imagine that uh, it probably doesn't lead to great creative output i don't think the creative mind works best with somebody screaming at you like yeah do good create better yeah i think I've, I've never seen the, the value of it i've always walked away i've gotten in situations where i've gotten heated and i always apologize immediately which mm -hmm. i think is another good professional tip is if you step out of line mm -hmm. you can sidebar with someone it's very mature for you to say go to them and say i'm sorry like dude i've stepped out of line they're not gonna be like and if they're gonna they're allowed to react however they want in that moment because you're wrong you mm -hmm. wrong them you yelled at them you got upset you got overly defensive uh, you're humbling yourself in mm -hmm. that moment. And if you go and you just commit to just being like, listen, I'm really sorry. You can react whatever way. Mm -hmm. I know I was in, but know that I know I was in the wrong. And even if you don't necessarily believe it, it's really important to mm -hmm. do that with someone. I've, I've done it many times where I like message someone and I say, hey, can we just jump on a really quick five minutes? And I just apologize yeah. to them. And that's the whole goal of the thing. And then they, of course, come to me with kindness. And they say, yes, yeah, so, you know, we all care about this a lot. And that's why we get heated like that. It's just all, I don't know. I just, that, that's the most important thing to me is like uh, always being clear and communicating and honest. Yeah. I found that this is extra important as you get further along in your career. So like uh, in my, in my day job, I have people that in the that work for the company that it's important for me to set a good like leadership example and communicate clearly and all that. And I'm used to interacting with my friends where if you want to have your idea heard, you know, you got to be the loudest and you got to like, it's okay. Like with my, my guy friends that I grew up with, like we can, you know, curse at each other. We can be rough and tumble. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I've, developed a very strong personality over time and now in a leadership role in a company 
a whisper is heard as a yell. And this is something I'm still learning, but it's like, if I give criticism to somebody, somebody has an idea or something like they, they say something in a meeting. And to me, I'm offhand just speaking like I would speak to my friends and being really blunt and really direct and saying, well, I think that idea is stupid as is, but let's do this or something like I'm not even, I'm selfishly not thinking about their feelings. I realize now that having a leadership position amplifies everything that you do. Like every word that you utter has a megaphone attached to it and it's going to be heard way louder. So when you say something offhand or if you get upset with somebody, it's not the same as getting upset with somebody that's your peer. It's very different. So there's like this burden of responsibility to speak, I don't know, like a, a whisper is a yell. I'm, I'm struggling. I haven't said it out loud yet. I've just been thinking about this. So it's, I'm not very eloquent about it. <laughs> but it's like you, if you want to give feedback to somebody on your team, be direct, but be kind and be, uh, I don't know, what's the word when you're trying to think of somebody's feelings? Like empathetic. empathetic. Yeah, be empath yeah. <laughs> It's not a good sign that I didn't know that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, be empathetic about it because, yeah, when you have people that are under you, it's really, it's a lot easier to have that impact on somebody, to have that impact where they think, wow, that guy, you know, yelled at me or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I, um, yeah. And I also hate, I hate the, uh, the concept of leadership. I just hate it, uh, personally Why? a little bit. Uh, I'm a bit anti-authoritarian, I think okay. in my, uh, just personal life, but also it's, the thing that I always, literally always say, someone will say, like, I do, did a good job or something. The thing I just literally am wired, I've wired myself to say is, it's always a team effort. That's the only thing I say when I get praise mm -hmm. at work. Because literally, there's, of the things that I did, there's 10 other things I didn't do mm -hmm. that someone else did. And it's like, I don't need any, I don't, recognition, you can't buy a loaf of bread with, with recognition, you know? Uh, so I, what do I gain by getting it? And so like, and doing that in front of my team, uh, has had, uh, unexpected like things where they feel like very welcome to contribute to mm -hmm. the process. And I think it's just, that's what it's all about is like being kind, understanding the process. Does someone do less work than another person on a project? Sure. But am I here going to just waste my time, time? counting beans so to like be like well actually i deserve the most credit and then you deserve second most right. and you deserve third most and it's just like who, there's so many people who just like care too much about that mm -hmm. uh that like it's this uh, this idea of fairness that's like this trap that you fall into is like being fair mm -hmm. you know what i it's just why is it a trap oh because the pursuit of fairness is just like uh, it's like fairness is like a social construct, right? Things being even between me and you, uh, well, me and you are never going to be equal mm -hmm. in both input into something creatively because we both have different pasts that we can draw from. And maybe the experience that you're pulling from is much more difficult than the experience I'm pulling from, but the labor that I'm committing is greater than the labor that you're committing. And so like specifically in this instance, finding fairness is just like, I don't know, I don't have a calculator that can do it, you mm -hmm. know, and I don't really care to invent one. So I just, just like, just always say it's everybody equally. Who cares? Right. Right. <laughs> That's fair. That's fairness. Like <laughs> it's like right. sitting there and trying to calculate it so that it's, I got to make sure everybody gets credit in the right order. I mean, we see it in the movie industry right. and things. I once had, I once created a call, call sheet in, uh, uh, when I was in my TV days and I, I, I hated doing it because I once mislabeled an executive producer as a producer and it was, he was not given the credit that he deserved on this sheet that exclusively what people do is they go, there's my name. 4.15. Okay. I'll be there at 4.15. Right. You know, but for some reason, having the executive next to his title was like the most important part. It's wow. because he was in search of this. That's not fair. Right. Because you're, you're, this person's a producer and I'm an executive producer and we're shown as equals. That's not fair to me. Right. But what are you talking about? You know, like, it's not, that's not what we're here for. Right. So like, if you just drop that, you can spend a lot of time doing other things. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I imagine your team must respond well to that. I, I hope so. Um, you know, I, I just try and do right by them. I, I feel really lucky to have the team that I do at work. And um, uh, they, I, my goal with my career is to be the greatest social media creative and gaming period. End of story. And uh, the thing I need to do that is an immaculate team. And I have it. It's great. Dude, let's end on that. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> great. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing.